Good evening, good afternoon, and good morning to you, wherever you are in the world. And welcome to The Show Must Go Online. I'm Mariam Grace, actor and director, and I'm proud to present Shakespeare's Pericles to you tonight. The Show Must Go Online is a movement that believes in Shakespeare for everyone. In 2020, TSMGO created 41 shows, including Shakespeare's entire first folio in chronological order. The shows now have more than a quarter of a million views from more than 60 countries, involving over 500 actors and creatives, winning several awards and critical acclaim in the process. Tonight, we are excited to continue that mission and bring you the rarely performed but highly requested Pericles. We are also proud to announce that for the first time, this evening's performance will be live interpreted into BSL by Jan Guest. Tonight's production of William Shakespeare's Pericles will commence in approximately 10 minutes. Please like this video, subscribe to the channel, remembering of course to hit the bell icon to receive all notifications, and follow us at TSMGO Online Live on Twitter, or at The Show Must Go Online on Insta and Facebook. You can also post your reactions using the hashtag Show Must Go Online. Please be aware that tonight's performance contains language referencing incest, sexual violence, human trafficking, drowning and death by childbirth. And now, to introduce tonight's play, it is my pleasure to welcome to the show the wonderful Wendy Lennon. Thank you. Thank you, Wendy. Wendy Lennon is a PhD student at the Shakespeare Institute, a member of the Scholars of Colour Network and an English teacher. Wendy is also the founder of Shakespeare, Race and Pedagogy, an education initiative and free online event which seeks to share, celebrate and reinvigorate approaches to the teaching and study of Shakespeare's plays. Wendy, the show is Pericles and the floor is yours. Thank you. The sea is as much of a central character as Pericles himself. Like the movement of the tide, we are repelled and rewarded by the play's characters, actions and events, with its incest, attempted murder and marriages. Travels and travails across the tempestuous seas not only gives us a sense of early modern maritime exploration, but the peripatetic nature of the play also acutely reminds us of our current lockdown existence and intensifies our gratitude to Rob, Mariam and the class cast for giving us the opportunity to travel with them from Tyre to Antioch, Ephesus, Mytilene and Pentapolis. Unlike the Mediterranean migration of relaxed travel, leisure and pleasure I hope we'll, we will enjoy post lockdown, Pericles is a play of travails. As Daniel Victus notes, the various spellings of travail and travel signified labour, trouble, discomfort, hardship and pain. Cataclysmic voyages and storms transform and define the characters in this brilliant production. Transformations that ebb and flow through a series of social, political and sexual anxieties. The audience invests and participates in the character's attempts to overcome. Characters and audience are rewarded with resurrections and revivals in ways we are denied in tragedies such as King Lear. I invite you to dip your toes into the ocean of this play and sail along with the narrator whose narrative framing helps to make the implausible plausible. Before the play begins, I shall summarise the key events, not as a Romeo and Juliet prologue plot spoiler, but as a chorus to provide a much needed prefatory bridge to knit together the action and events of this collaborative piece. There are many unresolved questions surrounding the composition of the play, yet it is generally agreed that Pericles was not written by Shakespeare alone. Perhaps George Wilkins wrote scenes one to nine with the rest of the play attributed to Shakespeare. Despite the uncertain authorship, the play achieves unity and popularity. Pericles opens with the play's first resurrection as the medieval poet Gower, author of the narrative poem Confessio Amantis, has risen from the dead to narrate the play. Gower's archaic language recalls an earlier time and serves as a counterpoint to the action about to unfold. Gower explains that King Antiochus has set a challenge for suitors who wish to marry his daughter. 
they must solve a riddle to win her hand. If guessed incorrectly, the suitor will die. Pericles, Prince of Tyre, whose dominance colonizer concerns seem to be expanding his kingdom and making an alliance through marriage, solves the riddle and is repelled to learn that Antiochus and his daughter are incestuous lovers. Knowing that he will be killed if he reveals the riddle's truth and killed if he fails the challenge, Pericles flees home to Tyre. His loyal friend, Helicanus, advises Pericles to undertake another travail, this time arriving in Tarsus, relieving the governor Cleon and his people from a devastating famine. Antiochus's pursuit to have Pericles killed continues and Pericles is forced to leave Tarsus. Pericles um, embarks on a treacherous journey that leads him to being shipwrecked. His shield and fortuitously himself are rescued by fish fishermen who take him to participate in another challenge, this time to win the hand of Princess Thaisa. Victorious Pericles and wife Thaisa are caught in a storm, which is the stage incarnation of Victus's definition of travail, a maritime journey of hardship, labour and pain, resulting in the birth of their daughter Marina and the apparent death of Thaisa. Losing his wife and entrusting his daughter to the care of Cleon and Cleon's wife Dionysa, Pericles is a broken man. Steve Mentz writes, for a figure like Pericles to go back to Tyre with neither spouse nor heir constitutes a dereliction of imperial duty. After 14 years of amazing, raising Marina, Dionysus' bitterness and jealousy of her foster child, akin to Lady Macbeth or a wicked stepmother, leads to Marina's attempted murder, pirate capture, and eventually being sold into prostitution. Marina, however, is a decidedly unsatisfactory prostitute, sending noblemen from the brothel as cold as snowball and saying their prayers. Perhaps authored by Shakespeare's hand, it is the agency of female travellers that empowers us. Marina's rejection of the carnal world of the brothel and decision to choose her own career is a form of liberation matched by her mother's female agency. Thaisa rejects her own death and resists the decomposition of her body that Pericles imagined in a sea grave, scarcely coffined in the ooze where a monument upon thy bones, remaining lamps the belching waves and humming water must overwhelm thy corpse. Through their independent wills and judicious preservation of their own bodies, we're rewarded with miraculous resurrection and reunion of characters and obliteration of others. Ending with marriage often leads the play to be catalogued as a romance. However, Pericles, as a character in a play, incorporates aspects of both tragedy and comedy. Therefore, the term tragicomedy is usefully applied if we must reduce it to a genre. Acknowledging dual authorship and dual genre confirms just two aspects of the play's hybridity. The first folio did not include Pericles and organised the other plays into comedies, tragedies and histories. The difficulty of placing the play also led to Pericles being labelled one of the problem plays. As a mixed race woman, I embraced the play's rejection of the borders of a categorical tick box and singular categorization. Furthermore, the fractured pieces, the play's composition, familial fragmentation across lands and sea, and refusal to remain in a single setting, resonates with the transformative nature of migration and displacement. The characters exist here, there, in and of the sea, and therefore belong nowhere, except rooted to their origin story, the only evidence of which is carried by Marina in her name and in the retelling of the story of her birth. Marina, the second generation, the daughter and bearer of both history and future, empowers me and brings me hope. Despite the coexistence of the plausible and the implausible, I invite you to share Pericles this evening so that we may be revived and restored by the actions and events that are about to unfold on your screen. Thank you. Thank you so much, Wendy, for that fabulous, inspiring and truly empowering introduction. Thank you so much. Thank you. And now, groundlings, the show is about to begin. So make sure you're sitting comfortably with snacks and grog aplenty and steady your sea legs for William Shakespeare's Pericles.
Act 1, Prologue. To sing a song that old was sung. From ashes, ancient Gower is come, assuming man's infirmities. It hath been sung at festivals, on ember eaves and holy ales, and lords and ladies in their lives have read it for restoratives. If you, born in these uh, latter times when wit's more ripe, accept my rhymes, and that to hear an old man sing may to your wishes pleasure prove. I life would wish, and that I might waste it for you like taper light. This Antioch then, Antiochus the Great built up this city for his chiefest seat, the fairest in all Syria. And I tell you what mine authors say. This king unto him took a peer, who died and left a female heir so buxom life and full of face as heaven had lent her all his grace with whom the father liking took and her to incest did provoke bad child worse father to entice his own to evil should be done by none but custom what they did begin was with long use account no sin the beauty of this sinful dame made many princes thither frame to seek her as a bedfellow, in marriage pleasures playfellow, which to prevent he made a law to keep her still and men in awe, that whoso asked her for his wife, his riddle told not, lost his life. So for her, many a white did die. As yon grim looks do testify, what now ensues? To the judgment of your eye I give my cause, who best can justify? Act One, Scene One, Antioch. A room in the palace. Young Prince of Tyre, you have at large received the danger of the task you undertake. I have, Antiochus, and with a soul emboldened by the glory of her praise, think no, think death no hazard in this enterprise. <laughs> Bring in our daughter, clothed like a bride for embracements even of Jove himself at whose conception till Lucina reigned, nature this dowry gave. To glad her presence, the senate house of planets all did sit to knit in her their best perfection. See where she comes, apparelled like the spring, graces her subjects and her thoughts. The king of every virtue gives renown to men. Oh, her face. The book of praises where is read nothing but curious pleasures, as from thence sorrow were ever raised, and testy wrath could never be her mild companion. Oh, you gods, that's made me man and sway in love. That's that inflamed desire in my breast to taste the fruit of yon celestial tree. Mm. Be my helps, as I am son and servant to your will, to compass such a boundless happiness. Prince Pericles. That would be son to great Antiochus. Before thee stands this fair Hesperides with golden fruit, but dangerous to be touched, for death like <laughs> dragons here affright thee hard. Her face like heaven enticeth thee to view her countless glory. 
which desert must gain, and which without desert, because thine eye presumes to reach, all the whole heap must die. Drawn by report, adventurous by desire, tell thee, the speechless tongues and semblance pale, that without covering save yon field of stars, here they stand martyrs, slain in Cupid's wars, and with dead cheeks advise thee to desist for going on death's net, whom none resist. Antiochus, I thank thee who hast taught my frail mortality to know itself, and by those fearful objects to prepare this body like to them to what I must, <laughs> for death remembered should be like a mirror who tells us life's but breath to trust it, error. <laughs> I make my will then as sick men do, who know the world, see heaven, but feeling woe gripe not at earthly joys as us they did. So I bequeath a happy peace to you and all good men, <laughs> as every prince should do, <laughs> my riches to the earth from whence they came. But my unspotted fire of love to you. <laughs> Thus, ready for the way of life or death, I wait the sharpest blow and type. Scorning advice, read the conclusion then, which read and not expounded, tis decreed as these before thee, thou thyself shalt bleed. Of all said yet, mayst thou prove prosperous. Of all said yet, I wish thee happiness. Oh, well, like a bold champion, I assume the list, nor ask advice of any other thought but faithfulness and courage. I am no viper, yet I feed on mother's flesh which did me breed. I sought a husband in which labour I found that kindness in a father. He's father, son, and husband mild, I mother, wife, and yet his child, how they may be, and yet in two, as you will live, resolve it you. Sharp physic is the last. Oh, but, oh, you powers, that gives heaven countless eyes to view men's acts. Why cloud they not their sights perpetually, if this be true, which makes me pale to read it? <laughs> Fair glass of light, I loved you, and could still were not this glorious casket stored with ill. But I must tell you, my thoughts revolt, for he is no man on whom perfections wait, who knowing sin within will touch the gate. You are a fair viol, and... <laughs> Your sense, the strings who fingered to make man his lawful music would draw heaven down and all the gods to hearken, but being played upon before your time, hell only danceth at so harsh a chime. Good sooth, I care not for you. Prince Pericles, touch not upon thy life, for that's an article within our law as dangerous as the rest. Your time's expired. Either expound now or receive your sentence. Great king, few love to hear the sins they love to act. Twould braid yourself too near for me to tell it. Kings are us gods in vice, their laws their will. But if Jove stray, who dares say Jove doth ill? It is enough, you know, and it is fit. What being, no, what being more known grows worse to smother it. All love the womb that's their first being bred, then give my tongue like leave to love. Heaven, that I had thy head. He has found the meaning, but I will close with him. Young Prince of Tyre, though by the tenor of our strict edict, your exposition misinterpreting, we might proceed to cancel of your days, yet hope, succeeding some from so fair a tree as your fair self, doth tune us otherwise. 
Forty days longer we do respite you, if by which time our secret be undone, this mercy's shows we'll joy in such a son. And until then, your entertain shall be as doth befit our honour and your work. Oh, how courtesy would seem to cover sin when what is done is like an hypocrite, the which is good in nothing but in sight. Oh, if it be true that I interpret false, then were it not so bad as with foul incest to abuse your soul, where you're both a father and a son, by your uncomely claspings with your child, and she, and oh, with pleasure befits a husband, not a father, and she, an eater of her mother's flesh, by the defiling of her parents' bed, and both like serpents are, who, though they feed on sweetest flowers, yet they poison breed. <sighs> Antioch, farewell, for wisdom sees those men blush not in sights blacker than the, in actions blacker than the night, who show no course to keep them from the light. One sin I know another doth provoke, murders as near to lust as flame to smoke. Poison and treason are the hands of sin. Aye, and the tages to put off the shame. Then, lest my life be cropped to keep you clear, I'll shun the danger which I fear. He have found the meaning for which we mean to have his head. He must not live to trumpet forth my infamy, nor tell the world Antiochus doth sin in such a loathed manner. And therefore, instantly this prince must die, for by his fall my honour must keep high. Who attends us here? Doth your highness call? Thaliard. Mm. You are of our chamber, Thaliard, mm -hmm. and our mind partakes her private actions to your secrecy. And for your faithfulness, we will advance you. Thaliard! Mm -hmm. Behold, here's poison. And here's gold. We hate the Prince of Tyre, and thou must kill him. If it's thee not to ask the reason why, because we bid it. Say, is it done? My lord, it is done. Enough. <laughs> Let your breath cool yourself, telling your haste. My lord, Prince Pericles is fled. As thou wilt live, fly after, and like an arrow shot from a well-experienced archer, hits the mark his eye doth level out, so thou never return unless thou say Prince Pericles is dead. My lord, if I can get him within my pistol's length, I'll make him sure enough. So, farewell to your highness. Thy adieu. Till Pericles be dead. My heart can lend no sucker to my head. Act One, Scene Two. Tyre, a room in the palace. Oh, my lord. Oh, my lord. Oh, oh, hey. Let none disturb us. Oh. Oh, why should this change of thoughts, the sad companion, dull-eyed melancholy, be my so used a guest as not an hour in the day's glorious walk or peaceful night, the tomb where grief should sleep can breed me quiet. Here pleasures caught mine eyes and mine eyes shun them. And danger, which I feared, is at Antioch, whose arm seems far too short to hit me here. Yet neither pleasure's art nor neither pleasure's art can join my spirits, nor yet the other's distance comfort me. <sighs> then it is thus. 
the passions of the mind that have their first conception by misdread, have after nourishment and life by care. The great Antiochus will think me speaking, though I swear to silence, nor boots it me to say I honour him if he suspects I may dishonour him. And what may make him blush in being known? Oh, he'll stop the course by which it might be known. Oh, with hostile forces he'll spread the land, and with the stent of war will look so, will look so huge. Amazement will drive courage from the state our men be vanquished ere they do resist, and subjects punished, that's ne'er thought offence. Which care of them, not pity of myself, but who am no more than as but as the tops of trees, which fence the roots they grow by and defend them, makes both my body pine and soul to languish and punish that before he will punish. <laughs> comfort in your sacred breast and keep your mind till you return to us peaceful and comfortable peace peace and give experience tongue they do abuse the king that flatter him for flattery is the bellows blows up sin the thing the witch is flattered but a spark to which that blast gives heat and stronger glowing whereas reproof obedient and in order fits kings as they are men, for they may err. When Signor Sooth here does proclaim peace, he flatters you, makes war upon your life. Prince, pardon me, or strike me if you please. I cannot be much lower than my knees. Or leave us else, but let your cares or look what's shipping and what's lading in our haven and then return to us. Go! Licanus, thou hast moved us. What seest thou in our looks? An angry brow, dread lord. Mm -hmm. If there be such a dart in Prince's frowns, how durst thy tongue move anger to our face? How dares the plants look up to heaven from whence they have their nourishment? Thou knows to have the power to take thy life from thee. I have ground the axe myself. Do you but strike the blow. <sighs> <laughs> oh, rise, pretty rise. <laughs> Oh, sit down. <sighs> Thou art no flatterer, I thank thee for it. And heaven forbid that kings should let their ears hear their faults hid. <sighs> Fit counsellor and servant for a prince, who by thy wisdom makes a prince thy servant. <sighs> what wouldst thou have me do? To bear with patience such griefs as you do lay upon yourself. Oh, thou speakest like a physician, Helicanus, that ministers a potion unto me, that thou thyself wouldst tremble, that thou thyself was tremble to receive. <sighs> Attend me then, right? I went to Antioch, yeah, where, as thou knowest, against the face of death, I sought the purchase of a glorious beauty, <laughs> from whence an issue I might propagate whose arms to princes and brings joys to subjects. <sighs> Her face was to mine beyond all wonder. But the rest, hearken I near, as black as incest. Hmm. Which by my knowledge found, the sinful father seemed not to strike, but smooth. But thou knowest this, it's time to fear when tyrants seem to kiss. Which fear so grew in me, I hither fled under the covering of a careful knight who seemed my good protector and being here, <sighs> the thought what was past, what might succeed. I knew him tyrannous and tyrant's face grow, decrease not, but grow faster than the years. Well, my Lord, since you have given me leave to speak, freely will I speak. Antiochus you fear, and justly too, I think, you fear the tyrant, 
who either by public war or private treason will take away your life. Therefore, my lord, go travel a while till that his rage and anger be forgot or till the destinies do cut his thread of life. Your rule, direct to any, if to me, day serves not light more faithful than I'll be. I, I do not doubt thy fate, but should he wrong my liberties in my absence? We'll mingle our bloods together in the earth, from whence we had our being and our birth. Hmm, okay. So I look from thee then and to Tarsus <laughs> intend my travel, where I'll hear from thee and by whose letters I'll dispose myself. The care I had and have of good of subjects good on thee I lay. Uh, whose wisdom strength can bear it. I'll take thy word for faith, no, not ask thine oath. Who shuns not to break one will crack them both. But in our orbs, we'll live so round and safe that time of both this truth shall ne'er convince thou showest thyself a subject shine and I <laughs> a true prince. <laughs> Act one, scene three, Tyre, an antechamber in the palace. So this is Tyre, and this the court. <laughs> Here must I kill King Pericles, and if I do it not, I am sure to be hanged at home? <sighs> this dangerous. Well, I perceive he was a wise fellow and, and had good discretion that being bid to ask what he would of the king, desired he might know none of his secrets. Now do I see he had some reason for it. For if a king bid a man be a villain, he's bound by the indenture of his oath to be one. Oh, shh, here come the lords of Tyre. You shall not need my fellow peers of Tyre further to question me of your king's departure. His sealed commission, left in trust with me, does speak sufficiently. He is gone to travel. How? The king gone? If further yet you will be satisfied why, as it were unlicensed of your loves, he would depart, I'll give some light unto you. Being at Antioch. What from Antioch? Royal Antiochus, on what cause I know not, took some displeasure at him, at least he judged so, and doubting, lest he had erred or sinned, to show his sorrow, he'd correct himself. So puts himself unto the shipman's toil, with whom each minute threatens life or death. Well, I perceive I shall not be hanged now, although I would, but... Since he's gone, the king sees must please. He escaped the land to perish at the sea. I'll present myself. <clears throat> Peace to the lords of Tyre. Lord Thaliard from Antiochus is welcome. From him I come uh, with message unto princely Pericles. But uh, since my landing, I have understood your lord has betook himself to unknown travels. Now, uh, uh, message must return from whence it came. We have no reason to desire it, commended to our master, not to us. Yet, ere you shall depart, this we desire. As friends to Antioch, may we feast entire. Oh. Act one, scene four. Tarsus. Oh, my Dionysa, shall we rest us here? Oh, and by relating tales of others' griefs, see if it will teach us to forget our own. That were to blow a fire and hope to quench it. For who digs hills because they do aspire throws down one mountain to cast up a higher. Oh, my distressed Lord, 
even such our griefs are here they are but felt is seen with mischief's eyes but like to groves being top they higher rise o oh, dionyza oh, who wanteth food i will not say he wants it or can conceal his hunger till he famish our tongues and sorrows to sound deep our woes into the air and eyes to weep till tongues feel fetch breath that may proclaim them louder that if heaven slumber while their creatures want they may awake their helpers to comfort them i'll then discourse our woes felt several years and wanting breath to speak help me with tears i'll do my best sir oh, this tarsus for which i have the government a city on whom plenty held full hand for riches strewed herself even in her streets whose towers bore heads so high they kissed the clouds and strangers ne'er beheld but wondered at whose men and dames so jetted and adored like one another's glass to trim them by their tables mm were stored full to glad the sight and not so much to feed on as delight all poverty was scorned and pride so great the name of help <laughs> grew odious to repeat oh tis too true let's see what heaven can do by this our change these mouths but who of late earth sea and air were all too little to content and please although they gave the creatures in abundance as houses are defiled for want of use they are now starved for want of exercise must those pallets who not yet two summers younger must have inventions to delight the taste would now be glad of bread and beg for it those mothers who to nousle up their babes thought not too curious are ready now to eat those little darlings whom they loved. So sharp are hunger's teeth that man and wife draw lots who first shall die to lengthen life. <laughs> Here stands a lord and there a lady weeping. Here many sink yet those which see them fall have scarce strength left to give them burial is not this true her cheeks and hollow eyes do witness it let those cities that of plenty's cup and her prosperity so largely taste with their superfluous riots hear these tears the misery of tarsus may be theirs there's a lot, Governor. Here. Right. Speak out thy sorrows, which thou bring'st in haste. But comfort is too far for us to expect. When we are described upon our neighboring shores, a portly still our ships make hit the word. <laughs> I thought as much. One sorrow never comes but brings an heir that makes succeed as his inheritor. And so in ours, some neighboring nation, taking advantage of our misery, have stuffed the hollow vessels with their power to beat us down, the which are down already, and make a conquest of unhappy me, whereas no glory's got to overcome. That's the least fear, for by the semblance of the white flags displayed, they bring us peace, and come to us as favors and not as foes. Thou speakest like him, untutored to repeat. Who makest the fairest show means most deceit. But bring they what they will and what they can, what need we fear? Our ground's the lowest, and we are halfway there. Oh. Go, tell their general we'll attend him here, to know for when he comes and whence he comes and what he craves. 
I go, my lord. Welcome is peace, if he on peace consist, if wars, we are unable to resist. Lord Governor, for so we hear you are, let not our ships and number of our men be like a beacon fired to amaze your eyes. We have heard your miseries as far as Tyre and seen the desolation of your streets, nor, nor come we to add sorrow to your, to your tears, but to relieve them of their heavy load. And these are ships you happily may think are like the Trojan horse was stuffed, stuffed within with bloody veins, expecting overthrow are stored with corn to make your needy bread and give lives to them who hunger, starved half dead. The gods of Greece protect you. And we'll pray for you. Oh, arise, I pray you, rise. We do not look for reverence, but for love and harborage of ourself, our ships and men. The which, when any shall not gratify or pay you with unthankfulness and fault, be it our wives, our children, or ourselves, the curse of heaven and men succeed their evils. Till when? <laughs> the which I hope shall ne'er be seen. Your grace is welcome to our town and us. <laughs> Which welcome we'll accept. <laughs> Feast here a while until our stars that frown lend us a smile. Act two, prologue. Here have you seen a mighty king his child, I wis, to incest, bring a better prince, and benign lord that will prove off in both deed and word. Be quiet then, as men should be, till he hath passed necessity. I'll show you those in trouble's reign, losing a might, a mountain gain. The good in conversation to whom I give my venison is still at Tarsus where each man thinks all is writ he speaking can, and to remember what he does, build his statue to make him glorious. But tidings to the contrary are brought to your eyes. What needs speak I? Good Helicane that stayed at home, not to eat honey like a throne from others' labors. For though he strive to kill and bad, keep good alive, and to fulfill his prince's desire, sends word of all that happens in time. How Thaliard came full bent to a sin, and hid intent to murder him, and that in Tarsus was not best longer for him to make his rest. He, doing so, put forth to see where when men be, they're seldom ease. For now, the wind begins to blow. Thunder above and deeps below make such unquiet that the ship should house him safe is racked and split. And he, good prince, having all lost by waves from coast to coast is tossed all perishing of men of power. He ought to escape, but so the fortune, tired with doing him bad, threw him ashore to give him glad. And here he comes. What shall be next? Heard an old gower. This locks the text. Scene 1. Pentapolis, an open place by the seaside. 
<laughs> Let cease your ire, you angry stars of heaven. Wind, rain, and thunder. Remember, earthly man is but a substance that must yield to you. And I, as fits my nature, do obey. <laughs> Alas, <coughs> the seas have cast me on the rocks, washed from shore to shore, and left me breath, nothing to think on but ensuing death. Oh, let it suffice the greatness of your powers to have bereft a prince of all his fortunes. <coughs> and have thrown him from your watery grave <laughs> to have death in peace is all he'll crave. <sighs> to nothing so fitly as to a whale, a plays and tumbles driving the poor fry before him, and at last <laughs> devour them all at a mouthful. Such <laughs> whales have I heard on the land who never leave gaping until they swallowed the whole parish, church, steeple, bells, and all. <laughs> but, tomorrow. Uh -huh. But master, if I had been the sexton, I would have been that day in the belfry. Why, man? Because he should have swallowed me too. And when I had been in his belly, I would have made such a jangling of the bells that he should never have left till he got the bell, steeple, church, and parish up again. But as the good king Simonides is off my mind, Simonides, we would purge the land of those drones that drop the beer for honey. <laughs> How from the finned subject of the sea, these fishers tell the infirmities of men and from their watery empire recollect all that men may prove or men detect. Oh. Peace be at your labors, honest fishermen. Honest? Oh. Good master, what's that? If it be a day fits you, search out of the calendar and nobody look after it. <laughs> May see the sea have cast upon your coast a man whom both the waters and the wind in that vast tennis court hath and that vast tennis court hath made the ball for them to play upon, entreats you pity him, and begs and asks of you that never used to beg. No, friend, can you not beg? Is <laughs> them in our country of Greece gets more with begging than we can do with working. Canst thou catch any fishes then? I never practiced it. Me then, thou wilt starve for sure. For here's nothing to be got nowadays unless thou canst fish for it. What I have been, I have forgotten of. But what I am, want, teaches me to think on. A man thrown up with cold, my veins are chill and have no more life than may suffice to give my tongue that heat to ask your help, which if you shall refuse, when I'm dead, for the time a man, pray you see me very Aye, Kefa, now God forbid it. And I have a gown here, come, put it on, keep thee warm. 
now. Oh, oh, oh I thank you, sir. A poor me sends a handsome fellow. Come, thou shalt go home and we'll have flesh for holidays and fish for fasting days and moreover puddings and flapjacks and thou shalt be welcome. Oh, I thank you, sir. Thank you, my friend. You said you could not beg. I, I did, but crave. But crave? Oh. And I'll turn craver too, so I shall escape whipping. Why are your beggars whipped then? Oh, not all, my friend, not all. For if all your beggars were whipped, I would wish no better office than to be beagle. <laughs> <laughs> but, Master, I'll go draw up the net. Right. Oh, oh, well, this honest mirth becomes their labor. How do you, sir? Do you know where ye are? Not well. Why, I'll tell you. This is called Pentaponis. And our king, the good Simonides. Oh, the good Simonides, do you call him? Aye, sir, and he deserves to so be called for his peaceable reign and good government. Ah, oh, he is a happy king since he gains from his subjects the name of good by his government. How far is his court distant from the shore? Maybe, sir, half a day's journey. And I'll tell you, he hath a fair daughter. And tomorrow is her birthday. And there are princes and knights come from all parts of the world to just and turn it for her love. Oh, well, well, my fortune's equal to my desires. I could wish to make one there. <laughs> oh, sir, things must be as they may. And what a man cannot get, he may lawfully deal for his wife's soul. Help, masters! Help! Oh. There's a, a fish hangs in the net like a poor man stuck in the law. Twill only oh. come out. <laughs> Box on! Just what? at last! Turn to a rusty armor! Oh! Armor, friends! Oh, I, I pray you let me see it. Oh, thanks, fortune, yet that after thy crosses, <laughs> thou givest me somewhat to repair myself. And I thought it was my own part of my, and though it was my own part of my heritage, which my dead father did bequeath to, did bequeath to me with this strict charge, even as he left this life, keep it, my Pericles. It hath been a shield twixt me and death and pointed to this brace for that it saved me, keep it in like necessity. The, the which the gods protect thee from may defend thee. Oh, I, it kept where I kept, I so dearly loved it till the rough seas that spares not any man took it in rage, though calmed have gipped me again. Oh, I thank thee for it. My shipwrecks now no ill since I have here my father gave in his will. What mean you, sir? <sighs> to beg of you, kind friends, this coat of worth for it was sometime Arge to a king. I, I know it's by this mark. He loved me dearly. For his sake, I wish the having of it and that you guide me to your sovereign's court where with it, I may appear a gentleman. And if that's ever my low fortunes, better I'll repay, <laughs> I'll repay. <laughs> You, your bounties. Till then, rest your labor. Why, wilt thou journey for the lady? Oh, I'll show the virtue I have borne in art. <laughs> why, why'd you take it? And the gods give thee grant. Uh, but aren't you, my friend, was we that made up this garment through the rough seams of the waters. There are certain condolements, certain bales, I hope, sir, if you thrive, you'll remember from whence you had them. Believe I will, eh? and by your furtherance, I am clothed in steel. <laughs> and spite of all the rapture of the sea, this jewel holds his, his building on my arm. Un unto thy value, I will mount myself 
upon a courser whose delightful step shall make the gazer to joy to see him tread. Only, my friends, I am yet unprovided of a pair of bases. We'll sure provide. Thou shalt have my best gown to make thee a pair. And I'll bring thee to the court myself. Mm. Then, honour be but a goal to my will, so this day I'll rise, or else add ill to ill. Act two, scene two, Pentapolis. Are the knights ready to begin the trial? Are they are, my liege, and stay your coming to blot in themselves. Tell them we are ready. Our daughter here, in honour of whose birth these trials are, sits here thy like beauty's child, whom nature gat from men to see and seeing wonder at. It pleaseth you, my royal father, to express my commendations great, whose merits less. It's fit it should be so, for princes are a model which heaven makes it like to itself, as jewels lose their glory if neglected. So princes their renowns have not respected. It is now your honour, daughter, to entertain the labour of each knight in his device. Which, to preserve mine honour, I'll perform. <laughs> Who is the first that doth prefer himself? A knight of Sparta, my renowned father. And the device he bears upon his shield is a black Ethiop, reaching at the sun, the word Lux tua vita mihi, your light is my life. He loves you well that holds you his life of you. Who is the second that presents himself? Uh, a prince of Macedon, my royal father. And the device he bears upon his shield is an armed knight that's conquered by a lady. The motto thus in Spanish, Piu per dolcera que per forza. <laughs> for sweetness than for force. And with the third? The third of Antioch and his device, a wreath of chivalry. The word, me Pompey provexit apex. The crown of <laughs> triumph inspired me. Well, what is a fourth? A burning torch that is turned upside down. The word, qui me alit, me extinguit. What feeds me extinguishes me. Which shows that beauty hath his power and will, which can as well inflame as it can kill. <laughs> the fifth a hand environed with clouds, holding out gold that's by the touchstone tried, the motto thus, sic spectanda fides, so is faith tried. And what's the sixth and last of which the knight himself with such a graceful courtesy delivered? He seems to be a stranger, but his present is a withered branch that's only green at top. The motto, in hack spervivo, in this hope I live. A pretty moral. From the dejected stake there wherein he is, he hopes by your his fortunes, yet may flourish. He had me mean that of Buzz out which showed and anyway speak in his just commend, for by his rusty outside he appears to have practiced more the whipstock than the lance. He well may be a stranger, for he comes to an honored triumph strangely furnished. And on set purpose let his armor rust, until this day to scour it in the dust. A pity is but a fool that makes us scan the outward habit of the inward man. But stay. The knights are coming. We will withdraw into the gallery. Act two, scene three. Pentapolis, a hall of state and a banquet. Knights, say you're welcome with the full purpose based upon the volume of your deeds. As in a title page, you're worth an arm to more than you expect or more than fit, since every worth the show commends itself. Prepare for mirth, for mirth becomes a feast. You are princes and my guests. 
But you, my knight and guest, to whom this wreath of victory I give, and crown you king of this day's happiness. <laughs> I thank thee, my lady. It is more by fortune, lady, than by merit. Call it what you will, the day is your. I here, I hope, to by none that envies it. If framing an artist, art hath thus decreed to make some good, but others to exceed. And you are her labored scholar. Come, queen of the feast, the daughter, so you are. Here, take your place. Marshal the rest as they deserve their grace. We are honored by good family. our days, honor we love. For who hates honor hates the gods above. Uh, sir, yonder is your place. Some other is more fit. Oh, contend not, sir. For we are gentlemen, have neither in our hearts nor outward eyes envied the great, nor shall the low despise. <laughs> but you are right, courteous knights. Sit, sir, sit. By Jove, I wonder what that is the king of thoughts. These cates resist me, but she thoughts upon. By Juno, that is queen of marriage. All viands that I eat do seem unsavory, wishing him my meat. Sure, he is a gallant gentleman. Oh, he's but a country gentleman, has done no more than other knights have done. He's broken a staff or two, so let it pass. To me, he seems like diamond to glass. What, are you merry knights? Who can be, Who can be other in, in this there? royal yeah. presence? <laughs> yeah, with a cup that's stored unto the brim, as you do love, fill your mistress's lips, we drink this health to you. We, we thank your grace. Thank you, grace. It pause a while. Your night doth sit too melancholy, as if the entertainment in our court had not a show might countervail his worth. Knows it not you, Theisa? What is to me, my father? Oh, attend, my daughter. Princes of this should live like gods above, who freely give to every one that come to honour them. And princes not doing so are like to gnats, which make a sound but killed are wondered at. Therefore, to make his entrance more sweet, here say we drink the standing bowl of wine to him. Alas, my father, it befits not me unto a stranger knight to be so bold. He may my proffer take for an offence, since men take women's gifts for impudence. How? Do as I bid you, or you'll move me else. Now, by the gods, he could not please me better. And furthermore, tell him we desire to know of him. Of which he is, his name and parentage. The king, my father, sir, has drunk to you. I thank him. Wishing it so much blood unto your life. I thank both him and you, and pledge him freely. And further, he desires to know of you, of whence you are, your name and parentage. Oh. A gentleman of Tyre, my name Pericles, my education being in art and arms, who, looking for adventures in the world, was by the rough seas wreck of ships and men, and after shipwreck driven upon this shore. He thanks your grace, names himself Pericles, a gentleman of Tyre, who only by misfortune of the seas, bereft of ships and men, cast on this shore. Oh, by the gods, I pity his misfortune and will awake him from his melancholy. Come, gentlemen, we sit too long on trifles and waste the time which looks for other revels. Even in your armors, as you are addressed, will well become a soldier's dance. I will not have excuse for saying this. Loud music is too harsh for ladies' heads, since they love men in arms as well as beds.
well asked. Twas so well performed. Come, sir, here's a lady that wants breathing too. And I have heard you knights of Tyre are excellent in making ladies trip, and that their measures are as excellent. In those that practice them, they are, my lord. <laughs> oh, that's as much as you would be denied of your fair courtesy. Gentlemen, to all, all have done well. <laughs> A few were blessed. <laughs> Pages are likes to conduct these nights unto their several lodgings. Your sir, we have given order be next our own. Oh, I am at your grace's pleasure. <laughs> mm. Princes, it is too late to talk of love. And thus, the mark I know you level at. <laughs> Therefore, each one would take him to his rest. Tomorrow, all for speeding, do their best. Two, scene four, Tyre, a room in the governor's house. No, Ascanius, know this of me. Antiochus from incest lived not free, for which the most high gods, not minding longer to withhold the vengeance that they had in store due to his heinous capital offense, even in the height and pride of all his glory, when he was seated in a chariot of an inestimable value and his daughter with him, a fire from heaven came and shriveled up those bodies even to loathing for they so stunk that all those eyes adored them ere their fall, scorn now their hand should give them burial. It was very strange. And yet but justice, for though this king were great, his greatness was no guard to bar heaven's shaft, but sin had his reward. Tis very true. See, not a man in private conference or council has respect with him, but he shall no longer grieve without reproof. And cursed be he that will not second it. Uh, follow me then. Uh, Lord Helicate! A what? With me, and welcome. Happy day, my lords. Know that our griefs are risen to the top, and now at length they overflow their banks. Your griefs for what? Wrong not your prince you love. Wrong not yourself then, noble Helicane. Uh, but if the prince do live, let us salute him or know what grounds made happy by his breath. If in the world he live, we'll seek him out. If in his grave he rest, we'll find him there. And be resolved he lives to govern us, or dead gives cause to mourn his funeral, and leave us to our free election whose death indeed the strongest in our censure and knowing this kingdom is without a head like goodly buildings left without a roof soon fall to ruin your noble self that best know how to rule and how to reign with us submit unto our sovereign Live, live, noble noble. try honor's cause Forbear your suffrages. If that you love Prince Pericles, forbear. Take I your wish. I leap into the seas, where is hourly trouble for a minute's ease. A twelve month longer, let me entreat you to forbear the absence of your king. If in which time expired he not return, I shall with aged patience bear your yoke. But if I cannot win you to this love, go search like nobles, like noble subjects, and in your search spend your adventurous worth. 
whom if you find and win unto return, you shall like diamonds sit about his crown. Uh, uh, to wisdom, he's a fool that will not yield. And since Lord Helicane enjoineth us, we with our travels will endeavor. Then you love us, we you, and will clasp hands. When peers thus knit, a kingdom ever stands. Act two, scene five, Pentapolis, a room in the palace. <laughs> good morrow to the good Simonides. Nice. From my daughter, this I let you know that for this 12 months she'll not undertake a married life. Her reason to herself is only known, which from her by no means can I get. May we not get access to her, my lord? Faith by no means. She has so strictly tied her to her chamber that tis impossible. Only 12 months more she'll wear Diana's livery. This by the eye of Cynthia has she vowed, and her virgin honour will not break it. Loath to say farewell, we take our leave. So, we are well dispatched. Now to my daughter's letter. She tells me here, She'll wed the stranger night, and never more to view, nor day, nor light. Oh, to your mistress, your choice agrees with mine. I like that well. Hey, how absolute she is in it. Well, I do commend her choice, and will no longer have it delayed. Soft, here he comes. I must dissemble it. All oh, fortune. Hmm. To you as much, let me ask you one thing. <clears throat> what do you think of my daughter, sir? A virtuous princess. Yeah, and she is fair too, is she not? As a day, as a fair. Sir, my daughter thinks very well of you. I so well that you must be her master, and she will be your scholar. Therefore, look to it. I am unworthy for her schoolmaster. Oh, she thinks not so. I mean, peruse this writing else. What's here? A letter that she loves the Knight of Tyre. This is the king's subtlety to have my life. <coughs> Gracious Lord, a stranger and distressed gentleman that's never aimed so Hi, to love your daughter, but bend all offices to. Thou hast bewitched my daughter, and thou art a villain. By the gods, I have not. Never did thought of my levy offence, nor never did my actions yet gain her love or your displeasure. Traitor, thou liest. Traitor? Why, traitor? Even in. This, unless he be the king that calls me traitor, I return the lie. Now, by the gods, I do applaud his courage. <clears throat> my actions are as noble as my thoughts that never relished of a base descent that I, I came to you, I came unto your court for honour's cause, and not to be a rebel to her state. And he that otherwise accounts of me before shall prove his honor's enemy. No, yeah, here comes my daughter. She could witness it. <laughs> then, as you are virtual, angry father, if if my tongue did air so did air solicit all my hands subscribe to any syllable that's made love to you. Why, sir, say if you have, who takes offense at that which make me glad? Yea, mistress, are you so peremptory? I'm glad on it with all my heart. <clears throat> I'll tame you, I'll bring you in subjection. Will you, and not having my consent, bestow your love and your affections upon a stranger? 
who, for aught I know, may be, nor I can think the contrary, as great as blood as myself. Therefore, here, you mistress, either frame your will to mine, and you shall hear you, either by rule by me, or I'll make you man and wife. Nay, come, your hands and lips must seal too, and being joined, I'll thus your hopes destroy, and for further grief, God give you joy. <laughs> what are you both pleased? Yes, if you love me, sir. <laughs> oh, e e e even, even, <clears throat> my blood that fosters me. Uh, then you are both agreed. Yes. <laughs> if yes, it please, it, it, your majesty. If, if, if it, it please, pleases your me majesty. so well that I will see you wed, and then with what taste you can get you to bed. Huh? Act three, prologue. Now sleep is lacked half the rout, no din but snores the house about. Hymen hath brought the bride to bed, where, by the loss of maiden head, a babe is moulded. Be attent. And time that is so briefly spent with your fine fancies, quaintly etch. What's dumb in show, I'll plain with speech. By many a dern and painful perch of Pericles, be careful search by the four opposing cones which the world together joins is made with all due diligence that horse and sail and high expense can set the quest. At last, from Tyre, vain answering the most strange inquire to the court of Simonides, are the letters brought, the tenor these. <clears throat> Antiochus and his daughter dead. The men of Tyrus on the head of Helicanus would set on the crown of Tyre, but he will none. The mutiny he there haste to oppress, says to him, If King Pericles come not home in twice six moons, he, obedient to their dooms, will take the crown. The sum of this brought hither to Pentapolis, ravish the regions round, and every one claps can sound. Our pure parent is a king. <laughs> Who dreamt? Who thought of such a thing? Grief. He must hence depart to Tyre. His queen with child makes her desire, which who shall cross, along to go. Oh, make we all their dull and woe. Like Horida, her nurse, she takes, and so to sea. Their vessel shakes on Neptune's billow. Half the flood hath their keel cut, but fortune wound varies again. The grizzled north disgorges such a tempest forth that as a duck for life that dives so up and down the poor ship drives, the lady shrieks, and well near does fall in travail with her fear. And what ensues in this fell storm? shall for itself perform. I know relate. Action may conveniently the rest convey, which might not what by me is told. In your imagination, hold this stage the ship, upon whose deck the sea-tossed Pericles appears to speak. Act three, scene one. On a ship at sea. Still, thy deafening, dreadful thunder, densely quench thy nimble, sulfurous flashes. Oh, how like Corridor, ah, how does my queen? Oh, thou storm, venomously wilt thou spilt all thyself. Ah, ah, the seaman's whistle is as a whisper in the ears of death unheard. Now, like Corridor. Can't tell me such a place. Who, if it had conceit, would die, as I am like to do? Uh, uh, take in flowers this piece of your dead queen. How? How, like Horiga? Patience, good sir, do not assist the stumble. Here's Aldous is left living of your queen, a little daughter, for the sake of it being manly, and take 
come first. Oh, you gods! Why do you make us love your goodly gifts and snatch them right away? We here below recall not what we give, and therein may you honor with you. Concerned, even the father's charge. Now, bound may be thy life, for a more blustrous birth had never been. Quiet and gentle thy conditions. But thou art the rudest welcome to this world that ever was prince this child. Happy what follows. Thou hast as tiding a nativity as fire, air, water, earth, and heaven can make the herald thee from the womb. What courage, sir! God save you! Enough! I do not say the floor, it has done to me the work. Yet for the love of this poor babe, this fresh new seafarer, I would it would be quiet. Black the ball in there! Thou would not, will thou? Blow and split thyself! But see who <laughs> and the bright are the beloved of the moon? I cannot! Ah, your queen must overboard! The sea works high, the wind is loud, and will not lie till the ship be cleared of the dead. That's your superstition! Pardon us, sir. With us, the sea hath been still at first. We are strong in custom. Therefore, briefly yield her, for she must overboard straight. Ah, as you think, meet. Oh, most wretched queen. Yes, she lies, sir. Terrible childhood hast thou had, my dear. No light, no fire, the unfriendly elements forgot thee utterly. Nor have I time to give thee hallowed to thy grave, but straight must cast thee deathly coffin in the ooze, where for a monument upon thy bones, the air remaining lamps, the belching whale and humming water must overwhelm thy corpse, lying with simple felt. Oh, La Corrida! Bid Nestor bring me spices, ink, and paper, my casket and jewels, and bid Nikanda bring me the satin coffin. Lay the babe upon the pillow. Yet hide thee whilst I, hide thee whilst I say a priestly farewell, priestly farewell to her. Suddenly, woman! We have a chest ready beneath the hatches, boxed in between ready. I thank thee, Mariner. Say, what coast is this? Let me toss us. Thither, Mariner. Alter thy course for Tyre. When canst thou reach it? By break of day, <laughs> the wind sees. Oh, Mick for Tarsus. There will I visit Cleon, for the babe cannot hold out to Tyrus. There I'll leave it at careful nursing. Go thy ways, good Mariner. I'll bring the body presently. Acts 3, Scene 2, Ephesus, a room in Ceremon's house. Philemon, ho! Of my lord, call! I get fire and meat for these poor men. It has been a turbulent and stormy night. I have been in many, but such a night as this till now I ne'er endured. Your master will be dead ere you return. There's nothing can be minstered to nature that can recover him. Uh, give this to the apothecary. Tell me how it works. Oh, oh, hello. Oh, good morrow. Good morrow to your lordship. Why do you stare so early? Oh, sir, our lodgings standing bleak upon the seashore as the earth did quake. The very principles did seem to rend and all to topple. Pure surprise and fear made me quit the house. But that is the cause we trouble you so early. It is not our husbandry. Ah, you say well. But, but I do marvel that your lordship, having rich tire about you, should at these 
Early hours shake off the golden slumber of repose. It is most strange nature should be so uh, conversant with pain, being thereto not compelled. I hold it ever virtue and cunning would endowments greater than nobleness and riches. Careless airs may the two latter darken and expend, but immortality attends the former, making man a god. Tis known I have ever studied physic, through which secret art, by turning o'er authorities, I have, together with my practice, made familiar to me and to my aid the, the best infusions that dwells in vegetatives, in metals, stones, and can speak of the disturbances that nature works and of her cures, which doth give me a more content in course of true delight than to be thirsty after tottering honour, or tie my pleasure up in silken bags to please the fool and death. Your honour has through Ephesus poured forth your charity, and have called themselves your creatures, who by you have been restored, and not your knowledge, your personal pain, but even your purse stood open, hath built Lord Solomon such strong renown as time shall never ever. Lift there! Uh, what's that? So, so even now did the sea toss upon our shore this chest. It is of some rack. Uh, sit down, let's look upon it. Just like a coffin, sir. Uh, whatever it be. Yet yeah, wondrous heavy. Wrench it open straight. If the sea's stomach to be overcharged with gold, tis a good constraint of fortune it belches upon us. <laughs> tis so, my lord. How close, tis corked and bitumed. Did the sea cast it up? Oh, I never saw so huge a billow, sir, as tossed it upon shore. Wrench it open! <laughs> oh! It smells most sweetly in my sense, as if it hit my nostril. A delicate rose. So, up with it. Oh. 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 Most strange. Oh, you most potent gods. What's here? A course? Shrouded in cloth of state? Embalmed and entreasured with full bags of spices. A, a passport, too? Apollo, perfect me in the characters. Here I give to understand if e'er this coffin drives a land, I, King Pericles, have lost. This queen, worth all our mundane cost, who finds her gives her burying, she was the daughter of a king. Besides this treasure for a fee, the gods requite his charity. If thou livest, Pericles, thou hast a heart that e'er cracks for woe. This chance tonight. Most likely, sir. Nay, certainly tonight, for look. How fresh she looks! They were too rough that threw her in the sea. Make a fire within. Fetch hither all my boxes in the closet. Death may usurp on nature many hours, and yet the fire of life kindle again the oppressed spirit. I heard of an Egyptian that had nine hours lying dead, who was, by good appliance, recovered. Well said, well said. The fire and the cloths. The rough and woeful music that we have cause it to sound, beseech you. The vial once more. How <laughs> thou starest, thou block. The music there. I pray you, give her air. Gentlemen, she shall. 
nature awakes, a warmth breathes out of her. She hath not been entranced above five hours. See how she begins to blow into life's flower again. For heavens, through you, increase our wonder and sets up your fame forever. She is alive. Behold her eyelids, cases to those heavenly jewels that pericles hath lost, begin to part the fringes of bright gold. The diamonds of a most praised water doth appear to make the world twice rich. Live and make us weep to hear your fate, fair creature, rare as you seem to be. Oh, dear Diane. Where am I? Where is my lord? What world is this? Is not this strange? Most rare. Hush, my gentle neighbours. <laughs> Lend me your hands. To the, to the next chamber, bear her. Get linen. Now this matter must be looked to, for he, her relapse is mortal. Come, come, and Escalapius guide us. Act three, scene three, Tarsus, a room in Cleon's house. Most honoured Cleon, I must needs be gone. My 12 months are expired and Tyra stands in a litigious peace. You and your lady, take from my heart all thankfulness. The gods make up the rest for me. Your shakes of fortune, though they haunt you mortally, yet glance full wonderingly on us. Oh, your sweet queen, that the strict fates had pleased you had brought her hither to have blessed mine eyes with her. We, we cannot but obey the powers above us. Could I rage at war as doth the sea she lies in? Yet the end must be as it is. My gentle babe Marina, whom, for she was born at sea, I have named so. Here I charge your charity with all, leaving her the infant of your care, beseeching you to give her princely training that she may be mannered as she is born. Oh, fear not, my lord, but thank your grace that fed my country with your corn, for which the people's prayers still fall upon you, must in your child be thought on. If neglection should therein make me vile, the common body by you relived would force me to my duty. But if that to my nature need a spur, the gods revenge it upon me and mine to the end of generation. I believe you. Your honor and your goodness teach me to it without your vows. Till she'll be married, madam, by bright Diana, whom we honor all unscissored, shall this hair of mine remain though I show ill in. So I take my leave. Good madam, make me blessed in your care in bringing up my child. I have one myself who shall not be more dear to my respect than yours, my lord. Madam, my thanks and prayers. <clears throat> we'll bring your grace into the edge of the shore, then give you up to the mask Neptune and the gentlest winds of heaven. I will embrace your offer. Come, dearest madam. Oh, no tears, like Corridor, no tears. Mm -hmm. Look to your little mistress, on whose grace you may depend hereafter. Come, my lord. Act three, scene four. Ephesus, a room in Ceremon's house. Madam? This letter and some certain jewels lay with you in your coffer, which are at your command. Know you the character? It is my lord's. That I was shipped at sea, I well remember. Even on my evening time, but whether they're delivered by the holy gods, I cannot rightly say, but since King Pericles 
my wedded lord, I ne'er shall see again. A vestal livery will I take me to, and never more have joy. Uh, madam, if this purpose as ye speak, Dion's temple is not distant far, where you may abide till your date expire. Moreover, if you please, a niece of mine shall there attend you. My recompense is thanks. That's all. Yet my goodwill is great, though the gift small. Foundlings, this is your five minute interval. You now have five minutes to refresh your drinks, refresh yourselves and prepare for the second half. I'd now like to call Matthew Rhodes to come and give us a few words. Hey, Matthew. Hey, how are you? I am just having the loveliest time. What how are show. you? What a show. Um, yeah, having such a great time. Uh, we wanted to start uh, this interval by saying a huge, huge thank you to all of you uh, in the audience. We are so grateful for you, our wonderful patrons, and for your continued support. That support is how we're able to create live, engaging theater that spans time zones, oceans, and continents. Please spread the word to your friends, family, and fellow fans that theater is happening, and it's happening on the TSMGO Patreon page. If you're new to our Patreon, welcome! Yay! <laughs> Make sure to check out our amazing Patreon exclusives, behind-the-scene clips, and, of course, our new sonnet project, 154 poems interpreted and performed by 154 performers, with two sonnet new sonnets every week. In addition, Ruth Page, our excellent excellent Patreon manager, has curated a special collection of posts, photos, and interviews related to Pericles, and you won't want to miss out on those. If you'd like to support TSMGO and the performers tonight, while also celebrating your love of theater, check out our Redbubble shop. Miriam and I are here with our lovely mugs. Look at those. Cheers. Cheers. <laughs> There is also the complete First Folio Tour shirt with all the shows and dates from our First Folio collection. And who doesn't want some of the beautiful artwork by Carly Sponzo of memorable moments and characters from the First Folio and A Christmas Carol. You can find the link for the store in the video description right down there. Finally, if you're having a great time tonight and feel like increasing your Patreon donation, you can adjust your amount at any time on your Patreon page. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you so much, Matt. Um, Wendy, are you there? Would love to have a chat with you. Hey, Wendy. Hi. Thank you so much for that introduction. That was just incredible. Thank you. Thank you for having me. What an incredible first half. Are you enjoying it so far? Yes, everything. The costumes, um, the acts, just all of it. It's amazing what you've been able to create. Oh, thank you so much. And we're really happy to have you here. Um, and I suppose as well, a, a lot of people have been saying that it's a play that you rarely get to see performed, um, which I never understand, to be honest, because it's one of my favourites. What? Why do you have any thoughts, Wendy, on why maybe it's not so popular as some of the others? Well, I wonder, you did start with the disclaimer, so I'm not sure if it's... Um, I wonder if that's the reason it's not one of the most popular, but it is one of my favourites. Um, and I think despite those themes, there's so much to um, enjoy as we've already seen so far. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, I think it's, it's a really interesting one, isn't it? And um, I think it's it's one of those plays that is so relevant as well for the time that we live in, which I know you, you touched upon in your introduction so beautifully. and it did make me think, gosh, it's quite surprising actually reading this 400 and however old play, 400 year old play and actually seeing how much of it is so relevant today. 
Yeah. Yeah, definitely. It's, I think as, especially I mentioned female agency and I think that's really important for us. So I really related to that. Absolutely. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. And I, I really loved what you said about the kind of the displacement of it and the fact that it wasn't in the folio because they couldn't kind of place it like the others and feeling like sometimes like that in the world. And I just gosh, really related to that as well. And and I think when we first approached Pericles, we we were talking a lot about that, weren't we, Matt? That kind of sense of displacement about what is home and what does it mean to be at home somewhere and what does it mean to be a migrant and all of these things that are so pertinent to us today and continue to be so that are just like right there on the page. It's, yeah. Brilliant play. Yeah. Yeah. It's amazing. Um can you tell us a little bit more, Wendy, about uh, Shakespeare, race and pedagogy? I think our, our groundlings would love to hear a bit more about that. Yes, thank you. Um, so next week um, is the first online event and it's free um, and you can sign up. Um, and so I have international speakers, um, um, all different types of um, experts as well. So, yeah, I'm really, really excited. Um, so it'd be great if you could join us. Yeah, absolutely. And where can people find the the link to it? Um, so on my Twitter page at writer lemon, um, you can yeah the registration link is on there. Amazing, perfect. Well, we'll make sure to uh, to spread that out as well because I'm sure a lot of our groundlings would really love to uh, to join in that with that. That would be amazing. Thank you. Right, Matt, have you got any questions for Wendy or, or are we are we nearly off? Nearly off, but uh, I did have one last question um, just because it struck me during uh, your talk. You talked about the fact that travel used to be uh, such, uh, such a bigger ordeal and that we're kind of used to travel by now. Do you think that that's something that people miss when they're approaching old plays like this? Um. I think that travel now, I think because we haven't been able to travel, I think we're going to be approaching it in a different way. So I think um, the fact that you've been able to create this um, when we're so far apart is brilliant. But I do think that we're going to see travel differently and certainly appreciate it when we can. Yeah. Absolutely. I think anywhere I can travel that isn't my living room is going to be so exciting. <laughs> <laughs> fantastic thank you so much wendy for joining us and we will see you again at the end thank you all right groundlings the second half is about to begin i hope you're feeling refreshed and ready to climb aboard once more for the second half of shakespeare's pericles Act 4, Prologue. Imagine Pericles, arrived at Tyre, welcomed and settled to his own desire. His willful queen, we leave at Ephesus unto Diana there's a votaress. Now, to Marina, bend your mind whom our fast-growing scene must find at Tarsus, and by Cleon trained in music's letters, who hath gained of education all the grace which makes her both the heart and place of general wonder. But alack, that monster envy, oft the rack of earned praise, Marina's life seeks to take off by treason's knife. And in this time, our Cleon hath one daughter, a full-grown wench, even ripe for marriage rite. This maid hight Philotin, and it is said for certain in our story she would ever with Marina be. Be it when they weave the sleeted silk with fingers long, small, white as milk, or when she would with sharp needle wound the cambric, which she made more sound by her to or when to the lute she sung and made the night bird mute, that still records with moan. Or when she would with rich and constant pen 
veil to her mistress, Diane. Still, this filleton contends in skill with absolute Marina. So the dove of Paphos might with the crow buy feathers white. Marina gets all praises which are paid as debts and not as given. This so dark said filleted all graceful remarks that, that Cleon's wife with envy rare for good Marina a present murderer does prepare that her daughter might stand peerless by the slaughter. The sooner her vile thoughts to stead like Horida, our nurse is dead. And cursed Dionysa hath the pres the pregnant instrument of wrath pressed for this blow. The unborn event I do commend to your consent. Only I carry winged time post on the lame feet of my rhyme, which I never could so convey unless your thoughts went on my way. Dionysa does appear, with Leonine, a murderer. Act four, scene one. Tarsus, an open place near the seashore. Thy oath remember, thou hast sworn to do it. Tis but a blow, which never shall be known. Thou canst not do a thing in the world so soon to yield thee so much profit. Let not conscience, which is but cold inflaming, thy lone bosom inflame too nicely, nor let pity, which even women have cast off, melt thee, but be a soldier to thy purpose. I will do it, but yet she is a goodly creature. The fitter then the gods should have her. Ha! Here she comes, weeping for her only nurse's death. Thou art resolved? I am resolved. No. I will rob Tellus of her weed to strow thy green with flowers. The yellows. Blues. Ah, the purple violets. Ah, and marigolds. Shall a scarpet hang upon thy grave while summer days doth last? Ah, by me. Poor maid, born in a tempest when my mother died. This world to me is a lasting storm wearing me for my friends. Oh no, Marina, why do you keep alone? How chance my daughter is not with you? Do not consume your blood with sorrowing. Have you a nurse of, of me? <laughs> Lord, how your favours changed with this unprofitable woe. Come, give me your flowers ere the sea mar them. Oh, walk with Leonine. The air is quick here and it pierces and sharpens the stomach. Come, Leonine, take her by the arm and walk with her. I pray you, I'll not bereave you of your servant. Oh, oh, my love, the king, your father, and yourself with more than foreign heart. We every day expect him here, and when he, he shall come and find our paragon to all reports thus blasted, he will repent the breadth of his great voyage. Blame both my lord and me that we have taken no care to your best courses. Go, I pray you, walk. And be cheerful once again. Reserve that mm, excellent complexion which did steal the eyes of young and old. <laughs> Cannot for me. I can go home alone. Well, I will go. 
but yet I have no desire to it. Come, come, I know it is good for you. <laughs> Walk half an hour, Leonine, at the least, and remember what I have said. I warrant you, madam. I'll leave you, my sweet lady, for a while. Pray, walk softly. Do not eat your blood. <laughs> what? I must have care of you. My thanks, sweet madam. Is uh, this wind westerly that blows? Southwest. When I was born, the wind was north. Was so? My father, as nurse said, did never fear, but cried, gold seamen, to the sailors, galling his kingly hands, hailing ropes, and clasping to the mast, endured a sea that, that almost burst the deck. When was this? When I was born. Never was wave. No wind was more violent. And from the ladder tackle, washes off a canvas climber. Ha! That's one wall out! And, and with a dropping industry, they skip from stern to stern. Ah! The buzzing whistles and master horse and travels through confusion. Come, say your prayers. Well, what I mean you? Uh, if you require a little space for prayer, I grant it. Pray, but be not tedious, for the gods are quick of ear, and I am sworn to do my work with haste. Why will you kill me? To satisfy my lady. Why would she have me killed? No. As I can remember by my troth, I never did her hurt in all my life. I, I never spake bad word, nor did ill turn. To any living creature, believe me, Lord, I never killed a mouse, nor heard a fly. I, I trod upon a worm once against my will, but I wept for it. No, oh, how, how have I offended, were in my death my dealer and prophet, how, all my life, imply her in danger. My commission is not to reason of the deed but to do it you will not do it for all the world i hope you are well favored and and your looks for sure you have a gentle heart i saw you lately when you caught her in parting to that fought good sooth it showed well in you do so now your lady seeks my life. Come you between and save me, the poor, the weak. I am sworn and will dispatch. Oh, oh. old villain! A prize, a prize! Half part, mates, half part. Come, let's have her both suddenly. These are roguing thieves of the great pirate Valdez. And they have seized Marina. Let her go. There's no hope she will return. I'll swear she's dead and thrown into the sea. But I'll see further. Perhaps they will but please themselves upon her, not carry her aboard. If she remain, whom they have ravished must by me be slain. Act four, scene two, Mytilene, a room in a brothel. Bolt. Bolt. Sir? Search the market narrowly. Mytilene is full of gall gallants. We lost too much money this mark by being too wedgeless. We were never so much out of creatures. We have but poor three. More than they can do, and they with continual action are even as good as rotten. Therefore, let's have fresh ones. What well, air we pay for them? If they're not being conscious to be used in every trade, we shall never prosper. 
Oh, thou sayest true. Tis not our bringing up of poor bastards. Uh, as I think, I have brought me up some eleven. I two eleven and brought them down again. <laughs> but shall I search the market? What else, man? The stuff we have, a strong wind will blow it to pieces. They are so pitifully sodden. Yeah, well, they'll say it's true. There's too unwholesome a conscience. The poor Transylvanian is dead, that day with the little baggage. Aye, she quickly pooped him, made him roast meat for worms. Bah, yeah, but I'll go search the market. Uh, three or four thousand jequins for his pity a proportion to live quietly. And so give over. Why to give over, I pray you? Is it a shame to get when we are old? Oh, our credit comes not in like the commodity, nor the commodity wages not with the danger. Therefore, in our youth, we could pick up some pretty estate to none of us to keep our door hatched. Besides, the sore items we stand upon with the gods will be strong with us for giving her. Come. Other sorts offend as well as we. As well as we, I am better too. We offend worse. Neither is our profession any trade. It is no calling. Ah, but here comes Bolt. Come your ways, my masters, come. You say she's a virgin? Oh, sir, we doubt it not. Ooh, master, master, I have gone through for this piece, you see. If you like her, so if not, I have lost my earnest. Has she any qualities? Uh, she has a good face, uh, speaks well, and has excellent good clothes. But there's no farther necessity of qualities can make her be refused. What's her price, Bolt? Well, I cannot be baited one dwarf of a thousand paces. Ah. Well, follow me, my masters. You should have your money presently. Wife. Take her in, instruct her in what she has to do, that she may not be raw in her entertainment. Bolt, hmm? take you the marks of her, colour of her hair, complexion, height, her age, with warrant of her virginity, virginity. and cry, He that will give most shall have her first! Aha! <laughs> Maiden head were no cheap thing if men were as they have been, Get this done as I command you. Performance shall follow. The mine was so slap, so slow. He should have struck and not spoke. Oh, that these pirates not enough barbarous. They would overboard thrown me for to seek my mother. Oh, I lament you, pretty one. That I am pretty. Um, the gods have done their part in you. I <laughs> them not. You are light into my hands, way. You are light to live. The more my fault escape his hands where I was like to die. Aye, and you shall live in pleasure. Oh. Yes, indeed shall you. Yes. And taste, gentlemen, of all fashions. You shall fare well. You shall have the difference of all complexions. Why, what, do you stop your ears? Are you a woman? Ah, what would you have me be? And I am not a woman. What? An honest woman or not a woman? <sighs> Mary, whip the gosling. I think I shall have something to do with you. Come. You're a foolish young sapling and must be bowed, as I would have you. The gods defend me. <laughs> if it please the gods to defend you from men, then men must comfort you. Men must feed you. Men stir you up. <laughs> oh, um, bolts returned. Now, sir, hast thou cried her through the market? I have cried her almost to the number of the hairs, I have drawn her picture with my voice. Oh, and I prithee tell me, hmm? how dost thou find the inclination of the people, especially of the younger sort? They, they listen to me as they would have hearkened to their father's testament. There was a Spaniard's mouth watered, and he went to bed with a very description. 
Ah, we shall have him tomorrow with his best luff on. <laughs> tonight, tonight. But, but mistress, uh, do you know the French knight that cows or the hams? Who, Monsieur Varallis? Aye, hey. Well, he offered to cut a caper at the proclamation, and he made a groan of it, and then he swore he would see her tomorrow. Oh, well, well, as for him, he brought his disease here. He, here he does but repair it. But I know he will come in our shadow to scatter his crowns in the sun. Well, if we had of every nation a traveller, we should lodge them in with this sign. <laughs> uh, pray you, come hither a while. You have fortunes coming upon you. Mark me, you must seem to do what, to do that fearfully, which you commit willingly. Uh, despise profits where you have most gain. Uh, to, to weep that she live as she do makes pity in your lovers. Uh, uh, seldom but that pity begets you a good opinion, and that opinion a mere profit. I understand you not. Oh, take her home, mistress, take her home. These blushes of hers must be quenched with some present practice. Thou sayest true, if faith so they must, for your bride goes to that with shame, which is her way to go with warrants. Hey, if some do, and some do not, eh? But, mistress, if I have uh, bargained for the joint. <laughs> Thou mayst. Cut a morsel off the spit. I may so. <laughs> Who should deny it? <laughs> uh, come, young one, I like the manner of your garments well. Aye, by my faith, they shall not be changed yet. Bolt, spend thou that in the town. Oh. Report what a sojourner we have. You'll lose nothing by custom. When nature framed this piece, she meant they a good turn. Therefore, Say what a paragon she is, and thou hast the harvest out of thine own report. I warrant you, mistress, thunder shall not awake the beds of eels, as my giving out her beauty stirs up the lutely inclined. I'll bring home some tonight. Come your ways, follow me. My ears be hot, nice sharp. Oh, what is deep? I. Untied still, my virgin not will keep. Diana aid my purpose. What have we to do with Diana? Pray you, will you go with us? Oh, virgins. Act four, scene three. Tarsus, a room in Cleon's house. Why are you foolish? Can it be undone? Oh, Diana, Diana, such a piece of slaughter, the sun and moon ne'er looked upon. I think you'll turn child again. Were I chief lord of all this spacious world, i give it to undo the deed. Oh, lady, much less in blood than virtue, yet a princess to equal any single crown on the earth in the justice of compare. Villain Leonine, whom thou hast poisoned too. If thou hadst drunk to him, it had been a kindness becoming well thy fat. <laughs> what canst thou say to Pericles when he shall demand his child? That she is dead. Nurses are not the fates. To foster is not ever to preserve. She died at night, I'll say so. Who can cross it? Unless you play the pious innocent and for an honest attribute cry out, she died by foul play. Go to, go to. <laughs> of all the faults beneath the heavens, the gods do like this the worst. Be one of those that thinks the petty wrens of Tarsus will fly hence and open this to Pericles. <laughs> Do shame to think of what a noble strain you are and of how coward a spirit. Such proceeding, whoever but his approbation added, though not his prime consent, he did not flow from honorable courses. Be it so then, yet none does know but you how she came dead, nor none can know Leonine being gone. 
She did disdain my child and stood between her and her fortunes. None would look on her, but cast their gazes on Marina's face, whilst ours was blurted at and held a morkin not worth the time of day. It pierced me through. And though you call my course unnatural, you not your child well loving, yet I find it greets me as an enterprise of kindness performed to your soul. Daughter! Oh, heavens forgive it! As for Pericles! What should he say? We wept after her hearse, and yet we mourn. Her monument is almost finished, and her epitaphs in glittering golden characters express a general praise to her and care in us at whose expense tis done thou art like the harpy which to betray doth with thine angel's face seize with thine eagle's talent you are like the one that superstitiously do swear to the gods the winter kills the flies. But yet I know you'll do as I advise. Act four, scene four, Tarsus, before the tomb of Marina. Thus, Time we waste, and long leagues make short. Sail seas and cockles have and wish but hold. Making to take our imagination from born to born, region to region. By you being pardoned, we commit no crime to use one language in each several clime where our scene seems to live. I do beseech you to learn of who stand in the gaps to teach you the stages of our story. Pericles is now again thwarting the wayward seas, attended on by many a lord and knight to see his daughter, all his lives delight. Old Helicanus goes along. Bear behind is left to govern it. You bear in mind old Escanes whom Helicanus late advanced in time to great and high estate. Well sailing ships and bounteous winds have brought this king to Tarsus. So his pilot thought, so with your steerage shall your thoughts grow on. To fetch his daughter home, but first he's gone. Like motes and shadows, see them move. Your ears onto your eyes, I'll reconcile. See how belief may suffer by foul show. This Borrowed passion stands for true old woe. And Pericles, in sorrow all devoured, with sighs shot through and biggest tears o'ershowered, leaves Tarsus and again embarks. He swears never to wash his face, nor cut his hairs. He puts on a sackcloth and so to see. He bears a tempest, which his mortal vessel tears, and yet he rides it out. Now please you, wit the epitaph is for Marina writ by wicked Dionysa. <clears throat> the fairest, sweetest, and best lies here, who withered in her spring of year. She was of Tyrus, the king's daughter, on whom foul death had made this slaughter. Marina was she called, and at her birth, Thetis, being proud, swallowed some part of the earth. Therefore, the earth, fearing to be overflowed, 
hath Thetis birth child on the heavens bestowed. Wherefore she does, and swear she'll never stint, making raging battery upon the shores of Flint. No visor does become black villain so well as soft and tender flattery. Let Pericles believe his daughter's dead, and bear his courses to be ordered by Lady Fortune, while our scene must play his daughter's woe and heavy well-a-day in her unholy service. Patience then, and think you are all now in Mytilene. Act 4, Scene 5, Mytilene, A Street Before the Brothel. Did you ever hear the like? No, no, I never shall do in a place such as this, she being once gone. But to have divinity preached there? Did you ever dream of such a thing? No, no. Come, I am for no more bawdy houses. Shall go hear the vessel sing? I'll do anything that is virtuous, but I am out of the road of rutting forever. Act four, scene six. Mytilene, a room in a brothel. Well, I'd rather than twice the worth of her as she near come here. Aye, fire upon her. She is able to praise the god Priapus and undo a whole generation. We must either get her ravished or be rid of her. When she should do for clients her fitment and do me the kindness of our profession, she has me her quirks, her reasons, her master reasons, her prayers, her knees, that she would make a puritan of the devil if he should cheapen a kiss of her. Faith, I must ravish her, or she'll disfurnish us of all our cavalleria and make our swearers priests. No, a <laughs> pox upon her green sickness for me. Faith, there's no way to be rid of but by way to the pox. Here comes Lord Lysimachus disguised. Should have both Lord and loan if the peevish baggage would but give way to customers. Well, how now? Um, how a dozen of um, virginities? <laughs> now, the gods to bless your honour. <laughs> I am glad to see your honour in good health. Well, you may say so. Tis the better for you that your resorters stand upon sound legs. But how now? Wholesome iniquity have you that a man may deal with all and um, defy the surgeon? We have here one, sir. If she would, but there never came her like in Italy. What if she'd do the deeds of darkness, thou would say? <laughs> Your honour knows what tis to say well enough. Well, well, call forth, call forth. For flesh and blood, sir, white and red you shall see a rose. And she were a rose indeed, if she had, but... What, 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 prithee? Oh, sir, I, I can be modest, hmm? Well, that dignifies the renown of a board. No less than it gives a good report to a number to be chased. Here comes that which grows to the stalk, never plucked yet, I can assure you. <laughs> Is she not a fair creature? Oh, faith. She would serve after a long voyage at sea. <laughs> well, um, here's for you. Now leave us. I beseech you, Honor, uh, give me leave a word, and I'll have done presently. I beseech you do. First, I would have you note this is an honourable man. I desire to find him so that I may worthily note him. Next. He is governor of this country and a man who I am bound to. Well, if he governs the country, you are bound to him indeed, but how honorable he is in that, I know not. Pray you, without any more virginal fencing, 
Will you use him kindly? He will line your apron with gold. What he will do graciously, I will thankfully receive. Uh, uh, are you done? <laughs> <laughs> my, my lord, she is not paced yet. You must take some pains to work her to your manage. <laughs> Come, we will leave his honour and her together. Go that ways. Well, now, um, pretty one, um, how long have you uh, been at this trade? What trade, sir? Well, I, I cannot name it, but I shall offend. I, I cannot be offended with my trade. Please you to name it. Well, how long have you been of this profession? Ever since I can remember. Well, did you go to it so young? Earlier too, you sir. At five or at seven. Earlier too, sir. Now I be one. Why the house you, you dwell in proclaims you to be a creature of sale. Do you know this place to be a place of such a resort and will come into it? I hear say you're of honourable parts and are the governor of this place. But why hath your uh, principal made known unto you who I am? No principal. But why you're, you're her woman? She that sets seeds and roots of, of shame and iniquity. Oh, uh, you have heard something of my power and so stand aloof for more serious wooing. <laughs> but I protest to thee, pretty one, my authority shall not see thee or else look friendly upon thee. Come, bring me to some private place. <laughs> come, come. <laughs> if you were born to honour, show it now. If put upon you, make the judgment good that thought you, worthy of it. Well, how's this? How's this? Some more, here. Yeah. be sage. Me that am a maid, though most ungentle fortune have placed me in this sty, for since I came, diseases have been sold dearer than physic. That the God would save me, deliver me from this place, though they did change me to the meanest bird that flies in the pure air. I did not think thou couldst have spoke so well. Ne'er dreamt thou couldst. Had I brought hither a, a corrupted mind, thy speech had altered it. Hold, here's his gold for thee. Um, but why? and the gods strength intent for to me that the very doors and, and windows savor volley well, fare thee well thou art a piece of virtue and i doubt not but thy training hath been noble hold <laughs> here's more gold for thee A curse upon him, die he like a thief that robs thee of thy goodness. If thou dost hear from me, it shall be for thy good. <coughs> I beseech you on a one piece for me. Avaunt thou damned doorkeeper. Your house, but for this virgin that doth prop it, would sink and overwhelm you. Why? How's this? We must take another course with you. Hmm? If your babish chastity, which is not worth a breakfast in the cheapest country under the cope, shall undo a whole household, let me be gelded like a spaniel. Come your way, please. Would you have me? I must have your maidenhead taken off, or the common hangman shall execute it. Come, your ways. We'll have no more gentlemen driven away. Come, your ways, I say. How now? What's the matter? Worse and worse, mistress. She hath here spoken holy words to the Lord Lysimachus. Hmm? Oh, abominable! 
she makes our profession as if it were to stink for the face of the gods. Marry, hang her up forever. The nobleman would have dealt with her like a nobleman. She sent him away as cold as a snowball and saying his prayers too. Bolt, take her away and use her at your pleasure. Crack the glass of her virginity and make the rest malleable. And if she were a thornier piece of ground than she is, she shall be ploughed. Mark, you good. She conjures. Away with her. Would she had never come within my doors. Mary, thank you. She is born to undo us. Will you not? Go the way of women kind. Mary, come up my dish of chastity with rosemary and bays. Oh. Come, mistress. Come your ways with me. Neither will thou have me. To take from you the jewel you hold so dear. Really, tell me one thing first. Well, come now, your one thing. What canst thou wish thine enemy to be? Why, I could wish him to be my master, hmm? or rather my mistress. Hmm. Neither of these are so bad as thou art, since they do better at thee in their command. Thou holdst a place for which the painless fiend of hell would not in reputation change. Thou art the damned doorkeeper to every custrel that comes inquiring for his tib, to the caloric feasting of every rock, thy ear is liable. Thy food is such as has been belched on by infected lungs. Well, what would you have me do? Go to the wars, would you? Where a man may serve with seven years for the loss of a leg and have not money enough in the end to buy him a wooden one. Do anything but this thou doest empty old receptacles or common shores of filth serve by the danger to the common hangman any of these I ways are yet better than these for what thou professest a baboon could he speak would own a name too dear that the cops would save me, deliver me from this place. <laughs> he is, he's gold for thee. If that thy master would gain by me, proclaim that I can sing, sew, dance and weave with other virtues, which I'll keep from burst and we'll Undertake all these to teach. I doubt not that, but this popular city will yield many scholars. But, but can you teach all this you speak of? Prove that I cannot take me home again and prostitute me to the basest groom that doth frequent your house. Well, 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 well I, will, I will see what I can do for thee. If I can place thee. I will. But amongst honest women. Faith, my acquaintance lies little amongst them. But, but, but since my master and mistress hath bought you, there's no going but by their consent. Hmm? Therefore, I, I will make them acquainted with your purpose, and I doubt not I shall find them tractable enough. Come, I'll do for thee what I can. Come your ways. Act 5, Prologue. Marina, thus the brothel escapes and chances into an honest house, our story says. She sings like one immortal and she dances as goddess-like to her admired lays. Deep clerks, she dumps, and with her kneel composes nature's own shape of bud, bird, 
branch or berry, that even her art sisters the natural roses, her ankle silk twin with the ruby cherry, that pupils lack she none of noble race, who pour their bounty on her and her gain, she gives the cursed bod. Here we her place, and to her father turn our thoughts again. Where we left him? On the sea, we there him lost. While driven before the winds, he is arrived here, where his daughter dwells. And on this coast, suppose him now at end. The city strived God Neptune's annual feast to keep, from whence Lysimachus, our Tyrian ship espies, his banner's sable trimmed with rich expense, and to him in his barge with fervor hies. And you're supposing once more but your sight of heavy parapets. Think this his bark, where what is done in action or if night shall be discovered. Please you sit and hark. Act five, scene one. On board Pericles' ship. Where's off your indicator she can resolve you? Oh, here he is, sir. Uh, sir, there's a barge put off from Mytilene, and it is Lizzie, uh, Lizzie, uh, Lizzie Micus, the governor, who craves to come aboard. What is your will? That he have his. Uh, call up some gentlemen. Uh, oh, gentlemen, my lord calls. Doth your lordship call? Gentlemen, there is some of worth who would come aboard. I pray greet him fairly. <laughs> Sir, this is a man that can on you would resolve you. Oh, hi, reverend, sir. Uh, the gods preserve you. And you, to outlive the age I am and die as I would do. Oh, you wish me well. Uh, being on shore, Honouring of Neptune's triumphs, seeing this goodly vessel ride before us, I may to it to know of whence you are. First, what is your place? I am the governor of this place you lie before. Sir, our vessel is of Tyre, in it the king, a man who for this three months hath not spoken to anyone, nor taken sustenance, but to prorogue his grief. Upon what ground is his distemperature? Would be too tedious to repeat, but the main grief springs from the loss of a beloved daughter and a wife. May we not see him? You may, but bootless is your sight. He will not speak to any. Oh, yet let me obtain my wish. Behold him. This was a goodly person, till the disaster that one mortal night drove him to this. <clears throat> Sir King. All hail, the gods preserve you, hail royal sir. It is in vain, he will not speak to you. Sir, we have a maid in Mytilene. I durst wager would win some words of him. It is well be thought, as she, questionless with her sweet harmony and other chosen attractions, would allure and make a battery through his deafened parts which are now bedway stopped. She is all happy as the fairest of all, and, and with her fellow maids is now upon the leafy shelter that abuts against the island side. Sure all effectless, yet nothing will omit that bears recovery's name. But since your kindness we have stretched thus far, let us beseech you that for our gold we may provision have wherein we are not destitute for want, but weary for the staleness. Oh, sir, a courtesy, which if we should deny, the most just God for every graph would send a, a caterpillar, and so inflict our province. <laughs> Yet, once more, let me entreat to know at large the cause of your king's sorrow. Sit, sir, I will recount it to you. <clears throat> but see, I am prevented. 
Oh, oh, here's the lady that I sent for. Fair one. It's not a goodly presence. She's a gallant lady. Oh, she's such a one that, what I well assured, came of a gentle kind and a noble stock. I'd wish no better choice and, and, and think me rarely to wed. Oh, fair one, all goodness that consists in beauty expect even here, where is a kingly patient, if that thy prosperous and artificial feet can draw him but to answer thee in aught, thy sacred physic shall receive such pay as thy desires can wish. Sir, I will use my utmost skill in his recovery, provided that none but I and my companion mate be suffering to come in. Come, let us leave her, and uh, the gods make her prosperous. Like as the waves make towards their pebble shore, so do I mean it. Hasten to their end, each changing place with that which goes before in sequent toil, all forwards to content. Mark T, your, your music. No, no looked on us. See, she will speak to him. <clears throat> Hail, sir, my lord, lend ear. I am made, my lord, that never before invited eyes but have been gazed on like a comet. She speaks, my lord, that may be have endured a grief might equal yours if both were justly weight. The wayward fortune did malign my state, my their evasion was from ancestor who stood equivalent with mighty kings. But time hath rooted up my parentage and to the world and awkward casualties bound me in servitude. I will desist, but there is something glows upon my cheek and, and whispers in my ear, go not till I speak. My fortunes, parentage, good parentage, to equal mine. Was, was it not thus? What say you? I said, my lord, if you did know my parentage, you would not do me violence. I do think so. Pray you turn your eyes on me. You are like something that. What country, woman? Here of these shores? No. Nor of any shores. Yet I was mortally brought forth and am no other than I appear. Oh, I am great with woe and shall deliver weeping. My dearest wife was like this maid, and such a one my daughter might have been. Oh, my queen's her brows, her stature to an inch, as one like straight, her silver voice, her eyes as jewel-like and cast as richly. In peace, another Juno, who starves the ears she feeds and, make them, and makes them hungry, or she gives them speech. Where do you live? Um, where I am, but a stranger. From the deck, you may discern the place. Where were you bred? And how achieved you these endowments which you make more rich to own? If I should tell you my history, it would seem like lies disdained in your reporting. Let's pretty speak. Falseness cannot come from thee. For thou lookest modest as justice, and thou seemest a palace. 
for the crowned truth to dwell in, I will believe thee and make my sense credit thy relation to points that seem impossible. For thou lookest like one I love indeed. What for thy friends? Didst thou not say when I pushed thee back, which was when I perceived thee, that thou camest from good descending? So indeed I did. Rewards thy parentage. I think thou saidst thou hast been tossed from wrong to injury, and that thou thoughts thy griefs might equal mine if both were open. Some such thing I said, and said no more but what my thoughts did warrant me was likely. Tell thy story. If thine tell the story, if thine considered prove the thousand part of mine endurance, thou art a man, and I suffered like a girl. Thou dost look like patience gazing on king's graves and smiling extremity out of act. But for thy friends, a lot of them. If thy name was kind virgin, recount, I do beseech thee. Come, <coughs> sit by me. My name is Marina. Oh! I am mocked. And thou, my son, since God sent thee hither to make the world to laugh at thee. Patience, good sir, or here I'll seize. Nay, 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 be patient. Oh, thou little knowest how thou dost startle me to call thyself Marina. The name was given me by one that had some power, my father and a king. <laughs> uh oh, a king's daughter and called Marina. You said you would believe me, but not to be a troubler of your peace, I will end him. No, 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 but, but are you flesh and blood? Have you a working pulse and are no fairy motion? Oh, speak on, where were you born and wherefore oh, called Marina, Marina? for I was born at sea. At sea? What mother? Um, my mother was the daughter of a king who died the minute I was born as my good nurse, like Corrida, hath oft oh. delivered weeping. Oh, stop there. This is the rarest dream that ere dull sleep did mock sad fools withal. This cannot be my daughter. Bury it. Well, where were you bred? I'll hear you, I'll hear you more to the bottom of your story and never interrupt you. You scorn. Believe me, it were best I did give well, a I word. I will believe you to the syllable of what you shall deliver. Yet, please give me leave. How you came in these parts, where were you bred? The king, my father, did in Tarsus leave me till cruel Cleon with his wicked wife did seek to murder me. And having wooed a villain to attempt it, who having drawn to do it, a crew of pirates came and rescued me, brought me to Mytilene. But, <laughs> but, sir, whither will you have me? Why did we? It may be you think I'm me an imposture, no good faith. I am the daughter to King Pericles. Oh. If God, Pericles be. Oh, oh, Alexander! <laughs> Calls, my lord. My, oh, thou art a great and noble counselor, most wise in general. Tell me, if thou canst, what this mate is, or what is like to be that hath made that hath thus made me weep. I know not, but here's the regent, sir of Middleland, speaks nobly of her. He never would tell her parentage, being demanded that she would sit still and weep. Oh, elegant. strike me, honoured sir. Give me a gash, put me to present pain, lest this great sea of joys rushing upon me or bear the shores of my mortality and drown me with their sweetness. Oh, come hither, thou that forgets them that did, be, that did thee beget. Oh, thou was born at sea, buried at Tarsus and found at sea again. Oh, Hathenus, down on thy knees. Thank the holy gods as loud as thunder threatens us. 
this is Marina. What was thy mother's name? Tell me but that, for truth can never be confirmed if the doubts did ever sleep. First, sir, I pray, what is your title? I am Pericles of Tyre. <laughs> but tell me now, my drowned queen's name, as in the rest you said, thou hast been godlike, perfect, the heir of kingdoms, and another life to Pericles, thy father. Is, more, is it no more to be your daughter than to say my mother's name was Thaisa? Thaisa was my mother, who did end the minute I begun. Now, blessing on thee, rise, not my child. Oh, give me fresh garments. Oh, mine own Helicanus. <laughs> oh, mine own. Oh, mine own Helicanus. She's not dead. That task is as she should have been by savage Cleon. Oh, she, she shall tell thee all when thou shalt kneel and justify in knowledge she is thy very princess. <laughs> Who's this? Sir, tis the governor of Mytilene, who, hearing of your melancholy state, did come to see you. Oh, I embrace you. <laughs> uh, give me my robes. I am wild in my beholding. Oh, heavens bless the girl. <laughs> but hark, what music? Oh, tell Helicanus, tell Helicanus, my Marina, tell him, or oh, point by point, Therefore, yet he seems to dote how sure you are my daughter. But what music? My lord, I hear none. None? The music of the spirit. List my marina. Uh, it's not good to cross him. Rarest sounds. Do you not hear? All music, my lord. All I hear. <laughs> Most heavenly music. Oh, it nips me onto listening. A thick slumber hangs upon my eyes. Ah, oh, let me rest. I pillow. Be dead. So leave him all. Well, my companion friends, this would answer to my just belief. I well remember you. My temple stands in Ephesus. High thee did her, and do upon mine altar sacrifice. There, when my maiden priests are met together, before the people all, reveal how thou hast seen, didst lose thy wife, to mourn thy crosses. With thy daughter's call and give them reputation to the light. Or perform my bidding, or thou livest in woe. Do it and happy by my silver bowl. Awake and tell thy dream. Oh, Celestial Diane. And God is Argentina. I will obey thee. Helicanus! Sir? Oh, oh, my purpose was for Tarsus, there to strike the inhospitable Cleon, but I am for others' purpose first. Towards Ephesus, turn our blown sails. Ephesus, I'll tell thee why. Shall we refresh us, sir, upon your shore? and give you gold for such provision as is our intent for me. So, with all my heart, and when you come ashore, I have another suit. Hmm, yes, thou shalt prevail were it to woo my daughter, for it seems thou hast been honourable towards her. Sir, lend me your heart. <laughs> my Marina. 
Act 5, Scene 2, Ephesus, before the Temple of Diana. Now our sands almost run, more a little and then done. This my last boon give me, for such kindness must relieve me, that you aptly will suppose what pageantry, what feats, what shows, what minstrelsy and pretty din the regent, the regent in Mytilene made to greet the king. So he thrived that he is promised to be wife to fair Marina, but in no wise till he had done his sacrifice as Diane made, whereto being bound, the interim, right, you all confound, in feathered briefness, sails are filled and wishes fall out as they are willed. At Ephesus, the temple see, our king and all his company that he can hither come so soon, is by your fancies thankful to you. Act five, scene three. The Temple of Diana at Ephesus. Hail, Diane. To perform thy just commands, I confess, I here confess myself the king of Tyre, who frightened from my country, did wed at Pentapolis, the fair Thaisa, at sea. In childbed she died, but brought forth a maid child called Marina, whom, O oh goddess, yet wears thy silver livery. Voice and favor. You are, you are, oh, royal Pericles. What means this nun? She dies, help, gentlemen. Noble sir, if you have told Diana's altar true, this is your wife. Reverend Apera, no. I threw her overboard with these very arms. Upon this coast, I warrant you. It is most certain. Look to the lady. <sighs> ah, she is but overjoyed. Early in blustering morn, this lady was thrown upon this shore. I oped the coffin, found there rich jewels, recovered her, and placed her here in Diane's temple. May we see them? Great sir, they shall be brought you to my house, whither I invite you. Look. Thaisa is recovered. Oh, let me look. If he be none of mine, my sanctity will to my sense bend no licentious ear, but curb it, spite of seeing. Oh, my lord. Are you not Pericles? Like him you spake, like him you are. Did you not name a, a tempest, a birth and a death? The voice of the Thaisa. Oh. That Thaisa am I, supposed dead and drowned. <laughs> Immortal Diane. Uh, now I know you better. When we with tears parted Pentapolis, the king my father gave you such a ring. This, this. Oh, no more, you gods. Your present kindness makes my past misery sports. <laughs> you shall do well that on the touching of her lips I may melt and no more be seen. Oh, oh come. Be buried a second time within these arms. <laughs> <laughs> Look who kneels here, flesh of thy flesh, Thaisa, thy burden at sea and called Marina. 
for she was yielded there. Blessed and mine own. Hail, madam, and my queen. I know you not. You have heard me say when I did fly from Tyre, I left behind an ancient substitute. <laughs> Can you remember what I called the man? I have named him off. It was Helicanus then. There's still confirmation. <laughs> Embrace him, dear Thaisa. This is he. Oh, now do I long to hear how you were found, how possibly preserved, and who to thank, besides the gods, for this great miracle. Lord Saruman, my lord, this man, through whom the gods have sh shown their power, that can from first to last resolve you. Ah, pure Diane, <laughs> I bless thee for thy vision and will offer night oblations to thee. <laughs> Thaisa, this prince, <clears throat> the fair betrothed of your daughter, shall marry her at Pentapolis. And now this ornament makes me look dismal. I will clip to form. Hmm? And what's this 14 years? No razor touched to grace thy marriage day, I'll beautify. Lord Saruman hath letters of good credit, sir. My father is dead. Oh. oh. Heavens make a star of... Yet, there, my queen, will celebrate their nuptials, and ourselves will reign in that... and will in that kingdom spend our flowing days. Our son, and daughter shall in Tyrus reign. Ah, Lord Ceremon, we do our longing stay to hear the rest untold. Sir, leads the way. Epilogue. Antiochus and his daughter, you have heard of monstrous lust, the due and just reward. In Pericles, his queen and daughter, seen, although assailed with fortune fierce and keen, virtue preserved from fell destruction's blast, led on by heaven, and crowned with joy at last, in Helicanus, you may well descry a figure of truth, of faith, of loyal tie. In reverent ceremony, there well appears the worth that learned charity I wear. For wicked Cleon and his wife, when fame had spread his cursed deed, the honored name of Caracles to rage the city turned that him and his they in his palace burn. The gods for murder seem so content to punish, although not done, but met. So, on your patience evermore attending, new joy waits on you. Here, our play has ending. Congratulations, one and all. Get out here, take a bow, and give yourselves a huge round of applause. Just
to those of you watching around the world at home, thank you so much for joining us. We hope you've enjoyed the show. And now allow me to introduce you to the cast and crew, starting with our amazing producer, Matthew Rhodes. Hi, I'm Matthew. I'm an emerging theater artist on the occupied territory known as Western Canada. Our stage manager and master of props, Emily Ingram. Hi, I am a theatre maker based in Edinburgh in Scotland. On music and sound, it's Adam Gibson. Hi, I'm Adam. I'm a sound designer and composer based in London and Scotland. Also, we want to give a shout out to the wonderful Liat Itzaki, who provided additional music for us this evening. On dance choreography and also making a cameo as Lady, it's Victoria Ray Sook. Hello, I'm Victoria Ray Sook. I'm an actor, director and choreographer based in New York City. And our cast for this evening as Pericles, Gabriel Acamo. I'm Gabriel Acamo. Uh, I'm an actor and poet based in North London. As Gower, Murphy Hickey. Hi, I'm Murphy Hickey, a hard of hearing performer based in Canada. As Thaisa, Sasha Wilson. Hi, I'm Sasha Wilson. I'm an actor, writer and co-artistic director of Out of the Forest Theatre based in Somerset. As Marina, Maya Cohen. Hi, I'm Maya Cohen. I'm an actor and I'm based in Tel Aviv, Israel. As Simonides, Paul Folds. I'm an actor and I'm based in South London. As Helicanus, Rachel Chung. Hi, I'm Rachel. I'm a PhD student in Shakespeare based in Scotland. As Cleon, Steve Connor. Hi, I'm Steve Connor and um, I'm in the US. I'm an actor uh, based in Wilmington, Delaware. As Ceremon, Louise Lee. Hello, I'm Louise. I'm an actor based in London. As Lysimachus, Jason Adam. I'm Jason Adam and I'm from Birmingham, if you couldn't tell, Birmingham, UK, and I'm an actor. As Dionyser, Lindsay Beecham. Hi, I'm Lindsay Beecham. I'm an actor and I currently live in Norfolk. As Antiochus, Leo Atkin. Hi, I'm Leo. I'm an actor and I live in the wilds of rural Lancashire, UK. As Bored, Victoria Howell. Hello, I'm Victoria Howell. I'm an actor, a writer, occasional director, and I live in London. As Bolt, Guido Garcia Luechez. Hola, I'm Guido. I am based in London and I'm a performer and a storyteller. As Leonine, Shamiso Mushambi. Hi, I'm Shamiso Mushambi. I'm an actor and comedy writer based in London. As Diana, Sanjukta Nath. Hi, I'm Sanjukta Nath and I'm an actor and performer based in India. And our valiant swings for this evening, as also as Marshal and Messenger, Alexandra Katagida. Hi, I'm Alexandra. I act, stage manage and coordinate violence everywhere, including the internet. <laughs> and our other swing, and also cameoing as Lady and Pirate, it's Andrew Mockler. Hi, I'm Andrew Mockler. I'm an actor and musician originally from Middlesbrough. A wonderful BSL interpreter for this evening, Jan Guest. Hi, I'm Jan. I'm a BSL interpreter and I love Shakespeare. Thank you for having me. Artistic director of The Show Must Go Online, Rob Miles. Hello, everybody. I'm Rob Miles. I'm an actor, writer, director and creator of The Shakespeare Deck based in Glasgow, UK. And the executive producer of the show must go online, Sarah Peachy. Sarah?
Rob, do you want to give us your best Sarah impression? Hi everyone, this is Sarah Peachy. She's the executive producer of the show Must Go Online and is based in Glasgow, UK. <laughs> Thank you so much, everyone. Groundlings, do get your questions in for tonight's cast and crew. But in the meantime, if you've enjoyed the show, do tell your friends and family to sign up to the Patreon so that they can watch as well, as well as all the other lovely exclusive content that Matthew has already mentioned. Matt, have we had any questions coming in so far? Uh, not yet. It's just a lot of applause. Uh, there was one question that I saw earlier that was, uh, can we see the cat? Um, so Maya, I don't know if the cat is available right now, uh, <laughs> but there was also a question about, um, about who did the music. And so I know that we just, uh, had people introduce themselves, but maybe we can talk, start a little bit with talking about the music. Sure. Adam, do you want to take this? Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So, um, the music for this was, a uh, a mixture of music by myself um and music by an israeli composer called uh, liat um who we were, was absolutely wonderful to get on in this project um especially with just the wide variety of music that's in this show and the wide variety of places they go uh, i thought it was really wonderful oh and also um our own marianne grace did uh the the song marina's song she wrote that one so that's uh marianne's little portion of it but yeah um it's been a mixture of a few of us really for this one it's been really enjoyable i will caveat that by saying i didn't write the lyrics that was shakespeare it's <laughs> <laughs> all right uh, maya yeah. is uh, is the cat around for us to um give him a bow um well i can go grab him he's probably should i do it yeah i will be right back I know that our groundlings love any kind of pet cameo and we, I think we do have several pets in the cast so you know not in the cast that are, belong to cast members so if anyone does want to cameo their pets feel free. We are also starting to get some questions in so uh, the first one that we'll start with is how many different interplay references did you all spot and admire whilst working on the play? A lot. Anyone want to take this? Well, I, I can start. Um, there's definitely Macbeth, Hamlet. Um, I think a little bit of The Tempest as well. Perhaps. King oh, John, King Basically, I always think of Pericles as Shakespeare's greatest hits megamix. It's kind of like he just took all the good bits of all the other plays and went, what would happen if I just put them all in one play? And amazingly, it works. Excellent. Love it. Um, the next one uh, that we've had come in is... Uh, did you find a way to rationalize or do you have you discussed a reason why uh, Pericles didn't visit Marina until the time that he did in the play? Gabriel, do you want to take this? All right. Um, yeah, I, that was that was one of that was one of the bigger biggest questions, I think, that we um, talked about um, of, while we we're working on the script. Um, but. I think in my in my head canon, and I think Marin will agree. Um, he was just I, we decided that he that he felt it wouldn't be safe um, for um, Marina to be with him uh, with the loss of Thaisa. Um, he felt that he would be inadequate as as a father, um, and he wouldn't be able to give her the upbringing that he felt that she deserved. Um, and also, I think he just felt he was a bit cursed. He goes from <laughs> he goes from. Uh, Running a running from one situation to being shipwrecked to losing um, his wife to all kinds of horrible things happening. So I think with all the chaos, um, he just wanted her to mature as safe as possible before bringing him back, before bringing her back. Even um, I think we also decided that he doesn't decide until the scene where he leaves her. Um, but yeah, I'm not sure. I'm not sure if I've let the cat off the bag with that one. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, it definitely was one of those things that we, as soon as we'd noticed it, we did have quite a long conversation about because we thought it does initially seem very strange that for 14 years, he doesn't go back and then also convenient that he goes back just after um she's been killed yeah great thank you um next question is uh who did uh all the videos uh, i miss do they mean the um the sort of scene change videos or uh, they just the say who did the video. So I would say that we can talk about the scene change. And I think they also want to hear about how we got some of that amazing Tempest footage. So the uh, the intro sort of transition videos were all done by the wonderful Emily Ingram. The ones that display the act and scene. Um, the, the Tempest videos, the shipwrecks videos, um, were actually filmed in my bathtub, uh, with a phone, uh, using an under, uh, a phone case that's a waterproof phone case, that's the word. Um, so the phone was put into a waterproof phone case, uh, and then inserted into the bath. And then we basically just threw in, um, a load of twigs, pillowcases, scarves, made some waves and filmed it really close up um, and in slow motion. And I, I should probably give a shout out to uh, the wonderful Robbie Capaldi who did assist me with that and did all the edits. So thanks Robbie. Um, yeah, so it was, all, it was all done in the home with a phone. So you can make a shipwreck in your own bathroom. Welcome to the show must go online. Um <laughs> Uh, yes, excellent. And if you want to learn more about that, I believe that we should have a behind the scenes video on our Patreon. We do. So, uh, check that out after the show. Uh, the next question that we had come in was how long was the rehearsal process for this show? Good question. It was one week. And that was not full days, that was doing evenings and some daytimes uh, over the weekend. So not very long at all. I'm not sure how many hours we did in total, Matt. I think it was uh, just under 25. It's not as many as you would normally get for a regular play. Um, and so I think that... Uh, I'll, I, I'll say it till I'm blue in the face. This cast was absolutely incredible. And congratulations, all of you, for all the work that you did. Um, because to pull this off in this time frame is uh, an adventure. Um, and the next question that we had come in, uh, which I think would be really interesting just to sort of expand out, is how many different locations are there in the play? Um, and Miriam, I know that you had a lot of thoughts about uh, location in the play. So maybe you can discuss that a bit as well. Sure. Um, well, I'm, I'm happy to hand over to if anyone else wants to take the first part of that, and then I can talk about the sort of general idea for the locations. Go on, Murphy. There are a lot of different locations in the show, but I do find it interesting that I am in none of them, <laughs> um, which is almost like an added uh, separated location from the story. That's kind of fun. Um, maybe somebody else <laughs> wants to talk about the uh, locations in the story itself. Well, um... There's a lot of locations. Um, so I think there's probably, f I haven't even counted, probably about five, yeah, thanks Gabriel. Five, five different locations. Um, they are all n in the region that we now recognize as the Middle East and North Africa. So we, that's why we had a nod to that region in some of 
the costuming, uh, in the music, in some of the visuals. Um, yeah, and, and I think there there is sometimes a bit of confusion because a lot of people think of Pericles as the Greek figure in history and then assume that it's set in Greece. Um, but actually the play is based on, I believe it's Ap Apollonius of Rhodes or something like this. I might be getting that. Okay, great, I got that right. Um, which is uh, about the Middle East. So yeah, the, the name places, obviously we, we wouldn't call them those places today because over time the names have changed. But I think Antioch is uh, modern day Syria, Tarsus is in Turkey, um, Mytilene I think is one of the Greek islands um, and there's Lebanon somewhere in there as well. I can't remember which one, but yeah. I know. Thank you, Gabriel. Um, so yeah, it's apart from Antony and Cleopatra, it's the only other Shakespeare play that's set around that region. Amazing, thank you. Uh, the next question that we have here, uh, and I know that we have a couple of Shakespeare fans in the cast, so would love to open this out, is any insights or thoughts into why Pericles was not included by Hemings and Condal in the first folio, especially with its clear connections to the other three romances? This may be a good question for Wendy. Hello. Um, okay, sorry. So I think that um, it goes back to my introduction, the difficulties of placing the play and its genre, uh, which I think is one of the things that's so brilliant about it. Um, but I'm wondering if it didn't fit so neatly into the tragedies, comedies and histories um, as the other plays do. Um, but I, I think that's what makes it so great, but I wonder if that's why it was kind of kept out. And even now in additions, you sometimes, you know, you can see it in it, that it's catalogued as a romance um, with the endings of um, the marriage and so on. But as I mentioned, I do think it is a tragic, tragic comedy as well. Excellent. This is total gossip. This is total gossip. I wonder whether it's something to do with George Wilkins' alleged criminal activities as an innkeeper and whether there was any kind of like idea of the scandalous nature of the uh, the collaborator that might have helped to keep it out maybe. But that's, that's hot goss and nothing else. No scholarship involved. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you. I like that idea. <laughs> Uh, another question here, uh, specifically for you, Miriam, but again, would love to hear more uh, thoughts from the cast, especially with such an ensemble piece. Um, the play is so episodic and has two different authors. How did you manage to get the very unified feel that you achieved? Gosh, what a question. Um, Uh, yes, that's a very good question that I'm formulating a very good answer for, uh, hopefully. So I think we we try to kind of identify the unifying themes um, of the play. So we had uh, migration, displacement, loss, family, um, redemption, and I suppose we try to find where those fit in each scene. And I guess by finding the extremities of those and by finding the opposites of those in different scenes, in a way, it sort of brought a unity to the whole thing because, you know, we would go to one extreme and then in the next scene, you'd have the other, the other kind of end of the spectrum to it. So I suppose that might be how we kind of achieve that in a, in a very loose sense. Um, I think it does help as well having Gower as the narrator to kind of tie it all together. And obviously um, the wonderful Murphy did an amazing job there. Um, and that's why we decided as well to have Gower kind of not being in any location and being almost like a godlike figure 
um, looking at all of these events and characters and slightly having a hand in them. So I suppose, yeah, Gower is, is quite a useful narrative framing device to kind of bring that all together. Um, but I think that's one of the reasons as well that it's such a wonderful play is that it is so episodic and filmic in many ways. And we were saying right at the start, it's like a fairy tale. You've got all these real kind of big characters and big situations. And yet what it all boils down to is a story about a family being separated from each other and trying to find their way back to each other and trying to find their way back home. Oh God, Sasha. I'd also like to point out that the marvelous Maz has a lot to do with setting the tone of the piece because she encouraged us in rehearsal always to um, like find as much of that joy and vibrancy and kind of like full bloodedness of the text and the character. So like no matter what we were doing, whether it was a sort of more um, tonally intimate scene or if it was this big kind of bit of revelry, it was attacked with that same kind of like generosity of spirit. And I think that unifies it as a, you know, that brings all the different strands together really wonderfully. Oh, thank you, Sasha. That's really lovely. Fantastic. Um, uh, I have another question here. Uh, all around brilliant, but huge appreciation for the BSL interpreting. Uh, so, <laughs> question for Jan. Uh, how much preparation did it take? And could you see a script while you were interpreting? Um, usually for Shakespeare, um, you translate it into modern day BSL. Then you translate it into what it meant in Elizabethan English, because the meanings are very different now from then. Usually I get about three months. I had one week, same as everybody else. And no, I didn't have the script in front of me. I learned it. Kind of. <laughs> kind of. But um, it's just such a lovely experience for me to be really involved in the process as well. So thank you. I, I would just love to give a, another huge shout out to Jan there because Jan, as she said, has had to learn every single word, every single character, every single moment of this play and has done it in a week and has been so generous and wonderful. And we are so lucky to have her and so grateful. And um, this really means a lot to us. So thank you, Jan. Thank you so much for involving me. I feel quite emotional actually, because I don't usually get to be involved in rehearsals and things. Thank you, Jan. Um, uh, we had another question here uh, that said, I want to, uh, I kind of want to know more about the princess bride scene, uh, which I believe is referencing Antiochus. I've, is it not the one with the, Shut where Marina on. gets left? Of oh. course, <laughs> that makes way more sense. <laughs> It's it's ceremony bringing the most the mostly dead Thaisa back. From, you know she's only mostly dead. Anyone in that scene want to comment? I'm now frantically searching my brain for Princess Bride quotes that I can. <laughs> Let me explain. No, it takes too long. Let me sum up. <laughs> <laughs> Inconceivable! <laughs> Hello, my name is Inigo Montoya. You killed my father. Prepare to die. Come back next week, we're doing that one. <laughs> oh, please. Easy, I know it all. I haven't seen The Princess Bride, which is terrible, so I can't answer the question. Anyone? Who was that? Was that... I, I, will, I will say that I was what 
watching it the other night um, while procrastinating from doing music work, and uh, which which is is it a bad thing if it's Princess Bride? I'm not sure. Um, but it, yes, no. When I and I hadn't clocked that really until the like until, until I think yesterday's uh, run through, and I I, I thoroughly enjoyed it. I, I was sitting there like, yes, this is everything. This is grand. Um, uh, yes, no, and yes. It, if if we ever could in the world of theatre, oh, that would be incredible, wouldn't it? Uh. Uh, we had another question here. Is Shakespeare trying to say something about raising children in his plays? In so much as you never see one being raised. Closest would be R and J, but otherwise it's newborn babies and then marriage. Yeah, Murphy? Um, just purely logistics, I think a factor is when Shakespeare was writing plays, it would have been a monumental task to have, you know, a, a seven-year-old actor on the stage. Um, so I think that might be part of it, just the pure resources. Um, that's a very interesting point. That there, yeah, it's babies or adults, you don't really get that in between. Um, I think also the teenage boys who would have been playing women back then could have also, because they were doing that, there weren't a lot of uh, actors that could have been allocated to playing a child, perhaps. I think if we're looking for connections between art and artist, there's a question of his own absence in his children's lives uh, in their early years. That means maybe there wasn't the same experience to draw on um, of that period of life and development uh, where maybe there was a bit more connection later on that you could draw on maybe well, i think it's really funny that whoever asked that mentioned rnj because uh he wrote rnj a, a show about essentially at the end spoilers dead teenagers the year that his son died so I do think, like Rob is saying, art and artists, that there is that that connect, uh, you know, write what you know. And, you know, he probably didn't know all 36, but y you pull from what is in your heart and that there was that absence of his children in his life. Perfect. I think we have time for one more question. Uh, and it is for Jan. Uh, do you ever get hand cramps from signing? <laughs> no, weirdly enough, no. You're just so immersed in what you're doing, you don't think about it. You get a sore back, so usually I'm standing, but because of the proximity of what Maya had as her vision for the play, I had to be able to keep coming in and out of shot, which I'm not in a very big room, but it would, you know, a nearly 60-year-old woman wouldn't have looked very attractive just trying to run to the screen and then go back again. So I'm sitting down, which is really rare for an interpreter. We never you get used to standing up for hours and hours and hours. So actually sitting down was a very different um, discipline for me to, to learn to do. I've only ever done it once before with a disabled actress who wanted to be, to be in a wheelchair because she was in a wheelchair. So I gaze matched. Uh, but no, hand cramps, no. Once in a glass of wine about now, yes. But hand cramps, no. <laughs> And always, always interpreters you will find, they will order their drink for after the show before it starts, because afterwards we've just gone. So yeah, Teflon brain, yes, hand cramps now. You deserve that glass of wine, Jan. Well, I think we are maybe out of time. Thank you all so much for your questions and of course for watching. Um, you might now be wondering what's next? We've given you Pericles, you might be hungry for more. And I'm gonna pass over to our very own Rachel Chung to tell us a bit more about what might be next. Thank you, Maz. Um, so to reiterate, hi, I'm Rachel. Um, I'm a PhD student in Shakespeare and I mostly write dramaturg and direct. Um, so the folks at the show must go online have been kind enough to collaborate with me on Galatea by John Lilly. 
um, which is coming to you in April. Uh, just a quick blurb, Galatea is about um, two young women who, in order to escape uh, virgin sacrifices, don boys clothes and escape to the forest where they fall madly in love with each other. Um, it's a good old gay old time and I'm really, really looking forward to doing it with a majority queer cast uh, and I hope that you all tune in for it. Yes, Rachel, that sounds amazing and we will be there. Very on brand for me. So. <laughs> <laughs> Well, there you are, Groundlings. You have that to look forward to. Thank you all so much for tuning in tonight. Thank you for coming on this adventure with us. And please do have a wonderful rest of your evening. Lots of love. Bye-bye, everyone. <laughs>